Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and call the Senate Committee on Revenue to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Buck. Here. Senator Dignante. Here. Senator Severs Gansert. Senator Spearman. Here. Chair Neal. Here. Please mark um, Senator Severs Gansert present as she arrives. So just to give um, some housekeeping on this hearing today, make sure that your phones are on silent. Um, this is gonna be a pretty long hearing, so we're gonna have a 45 minute presentation and then we're gonna give one hour for support and one hour for opposition. And then same thing for neutral, if neutral actually exists in this hearing. Um, I know there are a lot of people down south so, and I know this, um, if you're going to have comments where you're gonna repeat what someone else says, ditto is an accepted response rather than repeating what someone else says. You could say, I love uh, SB 496, I support it, and then just close out. So I am gonna limit um, testimony to two minutes per person when you come up for support and when you come in opposition. And so with that, I will call the presenters to the uh, dais to come and so I'll open up the bill hearing for SB 496. Good afternoon, Chair Neal, members of the Committee of Revenue. My name is Roberta Lang and I serve as Senator for Senate District 7 in Clark County. It is my pleasure to be here with you today to present the film bill um, to the legislature. And I think I want to start by talking to you about my vision. You know, when I was thinking about it the other day, for 30 years I've been thinking about how we could diversify our economy in Nevada about how it could be different, about how we could create a sustainable industry to help us in the ebbs and flows in our state. And during COVID, we saw how our state was handcuffed. We couldn't do anything because COVID closed everything down and we had no other industry and what that did to our state. And so um, I had, in the interim, I've been meeting with film people and I was on the economic, one of the co-chairs for the economic forum for the chamber. And we talked about film and we talked about um, how we could have film in Nevada. And it all just came together for me. And um, which led to this bill. And I met the Bircher group who um, talked to me about their vision for what we could have in Nevada. And it just all came together and, and, and this bill came about and a couple of weeks ago the Howard Hughes Corporation and Sony came to me and they said we want to be part of your bill how can we be part of your bill and we were able to negotiate and to come to an agreement where we could add Sony and Howard Hughes to our bill to make it even better than what it was and I'm so excited for our state because look we all know that we need to come up with another industry in Nevada and that we need to have a vision for what it could be. We need to talk about sustainability and be able to have a sustainable economy that will last us, that will fund our schools, that will fund the things that we need in our state. And we need to have the courage, the courage to look past the number because the number is big and I will be the first to admit it, but we have to have the courage to look past that number and look at what we can get back for our state and the return on our investment. And so today, as you hear the presentation, and I want you to think about that. And the other component I think that's really important is our partnership with UNLV. You know, in US, at USC in California, they have they're in proximity to film and they're to the film industry, what I think UNLV could be to the film industry here in Nevada, and that we can help build the film school to be a prominent part of Southern Nevada. And on the campus of the um, film at the Bircher Group, there'll be uh, an education building that will train the pipeline for the future. Not only will we have a film industry and create a new industry, we're gonna create thousands of jobs that are gonna to add to our workforce. And, but in order to have that workforce, we have to train the people for it. So this, this um, training center will partner with UNLV and we'll be able to train our workforce for the future. I'm so excited about this. 
um, people say to me, when you talk about this, your eyes just light up because I see the vision and I see what it could mean for Nevada. And with that, I'd like to show you a brief video. Vegas, talking about a place where gambling is allowed, where everything is allowed. I'm talking about a palace, an oasis, a city. Vegas, baby, Vegas! My favorite Las Vegas film would have to be Diamonds Are Forever. I'm a huge James Bond fan. My name is Bond. James Bond. I think I most enjoy that movie, Casino. Here, I'm Mr. Rothstein. I'm not only legitimate, but running a casino. Some of those people were still alive when that movie was made. I can't overlook The Hangover. The Wizard with Fred Savage. This movie was made about esports with Fred Savage in Nevada in the early 80s. Hot air. I really like that it ends up landing in Vegas with a happy ending. Well, we Las Vegas. Productions that are based on history and history here in Las Vegas means only 50 years ago or so. Viva Las Vegas. We are very lucky to have productions to come, film for 28 days, show off our city, tell a story about our city. But what we really need is that permanence. We need that industry to not pack up and go away. There's always a clue. We love that we have this strip. We love that we have hospitality. But what else can we be doing to help diversify the economy so that when those ebbs and flows come, we're not as greatly impacted as, as well as for the students to come to UNLV. Two, one, action. What about now? Productions are the most mobile, fast-moving businesses. How do you anchor these productions to a place when they don't have to be anchored to it? And you do it through incentivizing them to create infrastructure. We are trying to create a permanent infrastructure for the state of Nevada that will allow the industry to find home on a permanent basis. The key goes on forever. Tax incentives are what allow the folks who are in the art scene to produce the kinds of experiences that Las Vegas is famous for and that, of course, Hollywood what it's famous for in the film industry. The Las Vegas Media Campus is a really fantastic new project anchored by 12 plus sound stages and then there's a variety of other different programs affiliated with the project to make it a true mixed-use project. On site we will be having not only the sound stages but the associated millwork, grip and lighting, parking facilities and a set of amenities that will include restaurants, health as well as outdoor space to allow them to enjoy uh, the remarkable views of the skyline of the Las Vegas Strip. For the back lot, our real focus is making sure this feels like a campus, so it's not just you come here and create and you leave. You actually come there, create, you have it, and you want to be there. Can you imagine a student walking on campus in the next 10 years and seeing all of that? There's no other experience like that potentially in the world. You basically have an entire facility that is focused on exactly what we're trying to train our students to do and be. When we were building the new academic building for the College of Hospitality, McCarthy built a building that did exactly what we were hoping for. I think to have been involved in the projects they have, particularly the projects the like Allegiant Stadium, but they understand quality. Being a part of the build of Allegiant Stadium and actually seeing behind the scenes in the design, right, it's made and built for all the things and the shows that come to Vegas. I don't believe anybody could have imagined the economic impact that Allegiant Stadium has. When we were building Allegiant, everyone said, well, football stadiums don't make money. And in fact, it is the number one highest grossing stadium in the country. That's what's so remarkable about the media campus. Similar to Allegiant Stadium, the media campus present a breath of fresh air in terms of economic diversification. We also see huge workforce development opportunities and there isn't anything like the Las Vegas media campus here. One of the fabulous outcomes 
outcomes of large infrastructure projects, large commercial projects, is all the supply chain and talent that starts to come to support that particular investment. We are bringing a whole new venture experience to Las Vegas that not only brings in jobs, but elevates what we do here, which is make magic. It's a location that UNLV was very lucky to get, and they are growing it very responsibly. The NLV Hotel School, this week, CEO world, number one in the world, and here's why. You don't graduate from this program without a thousand hours in the real world. And that's the spirit of our new initiative that we're looking to develop or film. It will provide a framework for our students to explore media and apply the skills that they're learning to real world opportunities. It's now 2023. Content as a concept has a much broader definition. It is film, television, music videos, commercials, but it's also the next evolution of entertainment, which is video gaming, the metaverse, the creation of the next level of reality. What I have seen Las Vegas lack all this time is economic diversification, especially technology-based economic diversification. This is the right thing to do, and this is the right step, and this is the right place to do it. I think this is a great project because it provides that holistic view around how can we solve problems within our workforce. This project is a clear example of that, not only in terms of what it does for the university, but also in terms of how it plugs in and connects with other industries and companies throughout the valley. And this project will help us out immensely. These are high-end jobs, high-paying jobs. These are jobs that will be here for a long time and really add back to the community. Today, UNLV allows you an on-ramp to the fun economy. If we don't continue to invest in that, though, it'll be just like if we don't continue to invest in the Las Vegas Strip. <laughs> That's no lie. When it comes to food and entertainment, we're the capital. Why not the media, too? Never say never in Vegas. It's a double win for us, that commitment, that infrastructure. We have the opportunity to establish 3,000 new jobs in Las Vegas, but then you also have opportunities for workforce development, in particular the younger kids, knowing that they can get involved. We want to keep that talent because that creative entrepreneurialism spurs additional creative entrepreneurialism. The young ladies who are participating in the Girl Scouts already are driven. The vision is that they will see themselves, whether it is behind the camera, in front of the camera, just the chance for kids to dream like they've never dreamt before. I just can't stop smiling looking at the environment and thinking about I'm going to be a part of this in some small way. The workforce as I see it within this project is redefined. We believe this project squarely hits the three major initiatives of diversification of the economy, improving the educational system, and workforce development. As each production receives its film tax credit, that tax credit will be contributed back to a educational and vocational fund by that production. I think in terms of equity gaps, this is the bridge from poverty to prosperity. And being someone who is low income, I can truly say that I wish I had this type of experience in my educational journey. This is the linchpin that takes both the university programs to the next step and takes the community to the next higher level. And if it takes some incentives, that is a very small price to pay for what we're going to gain in economic diversification, in job creation. The terms that we're proposing in this bill by way of infrastructure, by way of long-term commitment to the community, and by way of the total dollars really going back at that percent that we're proposing, that I think is something that is unique to the state of Nevada that will keep the demand there. Film-induced tourism is the idea that content created in film and television and everything that is distributed and consumed by someone induces them to say, I would like to go there. It's not the peach at the end of the film that drives the economic activity. In Las Vegas's case, what will be vastly more valuable are the scenes where folks are cruising the strip. The stories that show Las Vegas, that is just valuable advertising. Every time we have that on film, it's like having a television commercial run on the Super Bowl to send our brand out to the world. You see it because there's a Heineken in someone's hand and there's a BMW on the street. It has gotten to be a $23 billion industry. This is futuristic. I think this will be one of the opportunities for our legislators as well as our community and our local officials to come together. This 
get our community working again, the community as a whole, let's work together. This is going to be transformational. The whole university is about to excel in a way that the college that we're in right now excels. You guys got to go to Las Vegas. Las Vegas, anybody! Good afternoon, Chair Neal, members of the committee. My name is Greg Ferraro. I'm here today representing Bircher Development. I have a brief statement, and, and then we'll proceed with our presentation. I want to thank Senator Roberta Lang for her extraordinary hard work over the last two years that's culminated in this bill hearing today. I also want to recognize Sony Pictures Entertainment and Howard Hughes Corporation for their partnership in this bill. As you hear and think about this bill, consider the timing of why we're here today and what has taken place in our state, particularly in Southern Nevada, over the past three years. And pause and take stock, then turn your eyes to the horizon and take that first step toward Nevada's future, where new jobs are more plentiful, new opportunities are more abundant, and where we will have put in place an economic development plan to protect us and our economic future for the next 50 years. I want to quickly zero in on two fundamental questions we're likely to talk about today. First, does the state lose money on this program? Because of the combined weight of return on investment, net new economic benefits of this infrastructure-based plan, along with film-induced tourism, we argue the answer is no. Second, how long will it take for the program to stabilize? We think that's the sweet spot. In the next three to five years, while we ramp up to stabilization, billions of dollars will be spent without a government safety net in the infrastructure that will house and train the talent of tomorrow. That construction phase alone will put thousands and thousands of Nevadans to work and will generate significant revenue for the state and help contribute to a strong state balance sheet. The premise of this bill and the promise of this bill is that if we make an investment in ourselves as Nevadans and choose to compete with other states for long-term opportunities for our families, we'll be keeping true to who we are as Nevadans. Another way to look at it is that we're proposing to develop at a cost of almost $2 billion of private capital, two Nevada factories that will produce over a billion dollars of digital content every year exported around the globe. Chair Neal, after talking with you and others, we've already begun making changes to the original bill, and we hope to bring you and the committee an amendment soon so that you can take that under consideration. Seated beside me is my client Brandon Bircher, co-owner of Bircher Development and one of the architects of this important legislation who will take you through a presentation deck on the bill and an overview of Zone 1, followed by Mr. Bircher will be representatives from Sony and from Howard Hughes Corporation. Thank you, Craig. Um, my name is Bircher. Can you turn on your mic? Yeah, name is Brandon Bircher, and I'm gonna be sharing with you um, the overview of the Las Vegas, Las Vegas Media Campus in Zone 1. Um, who is Bircher? We are a 83-year-old, uh, five-generation, uh, family-owned business that um, has developed over 60 million square feet, uh, valued at over $7 billion. And many of our projects over the um, decades have been unusual projects that have been specialty in nature. Um, Sorry, I'm learning to. Yeah. It's on. 
Okay, uh, the Bircher Development has a, a number of specialty projects under its belt. The Academy of Television Arts and Sciences being one, the headquarters for the Emmys in North Hollywood. The Pacific Design Center, which is home to the interior design industry, over 1.3 million square feet in West Hollywood. And um, the um, uh, LA Wholesale Produce Mart, which is the largest uh, wholesale mart in the Northern uh, North America. Um, Yep, Tommy, can you give me a hand here? Um, thank you. Yeah, the site is located at um, the intersection of the Durango and Beltway 215 off of uh, the Durango exit. And it's uh, located across the uh, freeway from the uh, new Durango Casino and the Uncommons Development. It's located in the uh, Harry Reid Research and Development Park, which is a 110-acre facility being overseen by the Gardner Group. Um, the next slide is a photo of the um, development in its uh, entirety. Uh, the, in the background, you can see the five uh, buildings that are uh, the home for three uh, sound stages in each of those facilities, totaling 15 sound stages in the associated um, um, uh, infrastructure. In the back, you can see the uh, office building with a quarter of a million square feet of uh, related technology and um, pre and post production work. And in the foreground will be the home to the, uh, the Nevada uh, Media Lab. The site plan that you're looking at here in red is the um, 29 acres dedicated to the sound stages. In blue is the grip and lighting and associated warehouse. Uh, the green is the media lab area, and the orange would be the office and related uh, amenities. The project has uh, a value of over $800 million. It will have a total of 900,000 square feet of rentable. Uh, 430,000 square feet of sound stages, uh, support mill shops, and 340,000 feet of, of office, and 80,000 feet of support amenities in a 50,000 foot sound stage. The zone one is really inspired by the unique uh, industry transformation of the explosive um, growth that's occurred in the streaming and content creation industry. And the content industry itself is over $150 billion a year. Bircher is developing this in response to that shortage of the sound stages and production facilities in the Western US. And it's really Nevada's moment in time to finally enter this sector, putting really Las Vegas uh, strongly in the position of the entertainment capital of the world. The vision is that uh, Southern Nevada has been uniquely positioned to the proximity to the Southern California entertainment and content creation industry, something that no other state can uh, claim. Zone one also intends to provide a very compatible uh, environment that will allow content creators to take advantage of the ecosystem here in Southern Nevada with the existing film related small businesses, low tax and the lifestyle benefits. As part of a 100-year uh, uh, ground lease relationship with UNLV, Bircher is going to be serving as a connection between the film industry and its professors and uh, students. The staff and the students will be having a first hold option utilizing the sound stages and studio facilities rent free when they remain unused. Bircher will also be putting in place an integration and benefits program that will fuse many of the UNLV academic departments and enhancing the way new content is created at the university. UNLV's integration program is really intended to inspire uh, the talent of tomorrow and looking for the opportunity to integrate fundraising opportunities, uh, IP creation, scholarships, and the like. At the core of this development is the education and vocational programming. 
Um, we are committed to provide uh, UNLV with a film uh, integration office that will uh, house an individual and a team that will, uh, on a daily basis, be committing to integrating into the six UNLV schools that have uh, aspects of the film and television and gaming industry as part of their curriculum. The Nevada, the Nevada Media Lab, which is also located in the, is the forefront, it's over here to your left, um, my right, uh, is the uh, lab building of 50,000 feet focused on providing uh, the opportunity to integrate uh, uh, the middle schools, uh, high schools, uh, community colleges and universities as a result of the 3% contribution of that 30% tax credit. Thus, our um, content creators will be receiving a net 27%. The Media Lab is where the future workforce is going to be trained and the innovation is going to be taking place as the new sector of the Nevada economy blooms. This is a photo of the um, Nevada Media Lab. These are a partial list of some of the organizations and participating programs that will be part of the um, Nevada um, uh, Education and Media Fund. It will be a separate account created by the um, fund of uh, the 3%, which could total upwards of $19 million a year. Let's take an overview now of the tax credit itself and the infrastructure bill. It totals $190 million a year. It's broken into an infrastructure and a non-infrastructure component. Zone 1 is $95 million a year of tax credit allocated, as Zone 2 has $80 million. The non-infrastructure credits, which are available statewide, are $15 million a year. That's approximately 50% above the current $10 million in the current bill. It's a 20-year program that will begin upon the issuance of the first uh, tax credits issued in Zone 1. The 30% tax uh, base is given to pre-qualified and productions that are audited with qualifying expenses. The 27% then that is netted to each studio um, will be received after a 3% contribution by every production uh, filmed in the state of Nevada to this uh, education and vocational fund account. Up to 50% 50, uh, 50 of the um, uh, annual tax credits, uh, so that would be 95 million a year, could roll over for one year if they are unused. The film tax also has a escalator of, according to the Nevada CPI, beginning in uh, 2030. There'll be no abatements or incentives received uh, by any agency by the developers of Zone 1 and 2. And the uh, development and investment agreements for both developers of Zone 1 and 2 will be uh, completed within 120 days of the governor signing the bill. A major feature of this is the mandate to develop infrastructure. Zone 1's capital investment has milestones. There's $200 million required to be developed by 2027 before we are qualified to receive our first tranche of $55 million of credits. We have to finish up to another a total of $50 million uh, by 2029 to receive the balance of our 95 million or the additional 40. Zone one's structured uh, schedule at the moment looks as follows. Um, according to the Clark County uh, approval processes, we think we can be out by the end of 2024 and groundbreaking by the end of uh, 2024, first of 25. Opening is anticipated by early 2027 and the first filming productions would be receiving their tax credits within six months of opening. The project could be built out in a single phase. The milestones for uh, Zone 2 will be discussed uh, later in our presentation. We have uh, hired two uh, nationally renowned economists to take a look at the impacts of Zone 1 and 2, RGC Economics from Nevada and Camion Associates from New York. Um, the combined zone job creation is estimated to be 200, I'm sorry, uh, 26,000 jobs 
uh, with 10,000 construction jobs created over the first five years. 6,800 jobs would be created uh, for direct on-site and studio employment and another 10,000 estimated jobs from direct and induced job sources. But the economic impact created by this development are really probably the most profound elements that are uh, going to be the result of this infrastructure commitment. In order for a production or a accumulation of productions to receive the $190 million, they have to spend a minimum of qualified expenses of $633 million. But most films, according to national averages, spend six to seven X of, of that um, tax credit, which would mean that there'd be over $1.1 billion a year spent just in the creation of content in order to receive the $190 million of tax credits. Both studies have shown that the economic impact from this investment uh, of the, 90, uh, the $190 million, there's approximately 50% of that uh, recaptured in the form of revenue that the state will be investing annually in this program. Uh, the total impact from that $95 million annual investment would be over $2.6 billion a year, meaning that over 20 years, the impact of the state of Nevada would be over $51 billion. So to conclude, this bill really contains three primary components. It creates a permanent long-term studio infrastructure. It, uh, it makes the uh, Nevada Film Tax Credit Program competitive with the North American productions, so allowing us to bring some of the finest productions and film uh, uh, creators and scripted television to the state of Nevada, and it merges the industry with UNLV and the other great educational platforms from grammar school to higher education and trade schools. So to really quote our Honorable um, Senator Lang, SB uh, 496 finally brings that silver screen to the silver state. I'll be taking questions uh, after our presentation. Uh, Chair Neal, if that's acceptable. Good afternoon. Um, Chair Neal, Vice Chair Dagnate, honorable members of the committee, thank you for providing us with the opportunity to meet with you today to discuss our shared commitment to supporting and growing Nevada's film and television production sector. My name is Ravi Ahuja, and I serve as the chairman of the Global Television Studios and Corporate Development at Sony Pictures Entertainment. In my role at our company, I'm charged with leading our company produces about 300 television shows per year around the world. We don't have a reel today, normally I'd bring one, but uh, I'll tell you what some of those are, and hopefully some of those are your favorites. Shows like The Crown, Breaking Bad, The Good Doctor, Cobra Kai, The Night Agent, 90 Day Fiance, Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, Shark Tank, and many, many others, you get the idea. In our motion picture group, we release over a dozen feature films per year, a few recent ones that we'll all know are Spider-Man, No Way Home, Ghostbusters Afterlife, The Woman King, Where the Crawdads Sing, Jumanji, many, many others as well. At Sony Pictures, I also oversee corporate development and M&A activities along with our chairman and CEO, Tony Vincicuero. Tony was honored to travel to Carson City a few weeks ago, and some of you may have met with him then to meet with legislative leaders on this issue and regrets that he couldn't be here with us today. So you have me. Um, Sony Pictures recognizes that Nevada has the potential to become a major player in film and television production. The state's close proximity to California and to entertainment talent in combination with competitive production incentives, workforce availability, modern infrastructure, and an already strong tourism industry make Nevada incredibly well positioned to create a thriving local film and television production base. I'll say a little bit more about a couple of the key ingredients. First, the production incentives, right? Some important elements are 
a competitive production incentive program that is stable and predictable with enough credits reserved to meet anticipated demand, broad credit eligibility for production expenditures, reliable processes for credit monetization, and many other features. With such a program in place, the state can attract companies willing to make a long-term investment, which is very important, in studio infrastructure. The second is infrastructure, studios, but then also goods and services providers in the local communities. Of course, as when production companies come to a state driven by competitive incentives, they need a place to base their productions. That's why a state needs production infrastructure. Sound stages, back lots, production offices, post-production, visual effects, things like that. Productions operating from these facilities will also need access to local goods and services, and that's where local vendors come in. Productions need things like dry cleaners, caterers, car rentals, carpenters, construction supplies, gas stations, hotels, grocery stores, restaurants, barbershops, tailors, fitness facilities, many other things. Again, you get the idea. The third element is crew or skilled people, right? A crew base with the skills and size necessary to meet demand. It takes lots of people behind the cameras to make a TV show or movie. When you watch a TV show or movie, you're only seeing a few. There's many, many more behind the cameras. So a state should establish programs to train crew, including efforts to ensure workforce diversity, taking young people and putting them on a path to careers in this industry with jobs that pay an average of $123,000 a year, according to the MPA. So with these ingredients, incentives, providing studios with a way to help offset their production costs, infrastructure, providing studios with a place to film their projects, complementary businesses, big and small, orienting themselves to meet the needs of those facilities and the productions they are hosting, and a skilled crew base that continues to grow to meet demand. With all of that, with those ingredients, the Silver State can meet its potential as a competitive film and TV production hub. You know, in 1992, Louisiana established the first state tax incentive program for film and TV production. Today, most US states and territories maintain these types of incentives. And the most competitive among them, which includes states like Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico, New York, have seen great success in terms of hundreds of film and TV projects, tens of thousands of good paying jobs, billions of dollars in film and TV production expenditures on goods and services, and thriving production ecosystems built to last. In 2021, the California Film Commission reported, quote, in 2020 alone, productions in Georgia, Louisiana, New Mexico, and New York spent $18 billion in motion picture and television production. More than 300 film and television projects hired 167,000 cast and crew in these jurisdictions. Senator Lang's efforts to unlock Nevada's potential is something we are very excited about. If your state establishes a competitive production incentive program, you'll have multiple studio facilities rising in Southern Nevada, with two major projects already announced in connection with this legislation. With such a program in place, and this new studio infrastructure coming online, Sony Pictures is prepared to spend up to a billion dollars on film and TV production in the Silver State. We look forward to working with Senator Lang, Assistant Majority Floor Leader Miller, Senator Severs Ganser, Senator Scott Hammond, the Howard Hughes Corporation, Bircher Development, and our partners in labor and business and other leaders toward our shared objective. Thank you again for your time. Now I'll hand the mic to my colleague, Michael Morgenthal. Chair Neal, Vice Chair Dignate, honorable members of the committee, thank you for permitting me to speak with you today. My name is Michael Morgenthal, and I serve as Senior Vice President and Controller of Worldwide Production Finance for the Motion Picture Group at Sony Pictures Entertainment. In this role, I oversee the financial management of SPE's feature film productions, working closely with our creative and corporate teams throughout the life cycle of a production from development to post-production. Prior to my work at Sony Pictures, I served as Vice President Production Finance at Universal Pictures. Before overseeing production finance on the studio side, I worked as a production accountant on feature films. 
In my work at Sony Pictures, part of my role is to undertake the production planning process, which involves comparing the cost of a particular production budget between various filming locations. During this process, the studio physical production executives and production finance team will read scripts and build budgets for multiple production locales to determine which state or country would make the most sense, creatively and financially, for a film or television project. Several factors go into deciding where a project will be produced. We consider where a story takes place on screen, availability of necessary production infrastructure, and the availability of a local crew base. Among the most important considerations is the net cost of a project. We analyze avail available tax credit programs to help determine the most cost-efficient budget that also supports the creative needs of filmmakers. We'll review side-by-side -side cost comparisons between locations before making a final determination where to locate a film or television series. Production locales without competitive tax credit programs have not been contenders for high-impact film and television projects like one-hour dramas, which often have the potential to yield the most jobs and production spend. And in the case of television series, have the potential to remain in production through several seasons, meaning several years of steady employment in mostly union positions with competitive salaries and health benefits. Today, nearly 40 states and territories maintain production incentive programs. The states that have the most success provided long-term planning stability, which allowed for construction of multiple soundstage facilities and development of a large labor crew base to support several series and films working simultaneously. These states also saw the greatest gains in jobs and production expenditures, allowing for development of new businesses that now sell and rent supplies for productions such as camera, lighting, transportation, special effects, catering, and props. For example, a recent Sony Pictures feature project that filmed in Georgia spent over $2 million on local hotel rooms, over $300,000 on local car rentals, and paid the crew over $2 million in per diem, which they spent on local businesses such as grocery store, gas stations, bars, and restaurants. The production also spent over $2.5 million on local construction supplies, including lumber, and spent over $5 million on local construction labor to build the sets. We also spent over 500,000 on set dressing provided by local businesses and spent over 1 million on local catering for the crew. Different states utilize different kinds of credits. Production incentives are commonly in the form of tax credits based on a percentage of audited qualified production spend. These credits may be refundable or transferable as in the case of Nevada's current program. Other key US filming locations offering transferable film tax credits include Georgia, Illinois, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico. Recent studies from the California, New York, and New Mexico, which are among the most competitive states, found that those state programs have yielded positive returns on their investment. There is no question that their production incentive programs are essential to their thriving film and TV production industries. I would like to close by telling you a little about who we are as a company. Our production workforce is mostly unionized and enjoys competitive wages and health benefits. We're committed to diversity among our corporate employees, our production employees, and our, corporate, our suppliers of goods and services. This year, the Sony Group Corporation is being honored by the Ethisphere Institute as one of the world's most, most ethical companies for the fifth year in a row. We have prioritized environmentally sound construction and production practices through our Sony Pictures A Greener World Environmental Initiative. The studio reduces its ecological footprint by pursuing sustainable activities and partnerships that com combat climate change, preserve natural resources, and protect the health and safety of our communities around the world in all activities of the business. We appreciate the bipartisan effort to position Nevada for success in the fight for film and television production jobs and investment, and we look forward to working with Senator Lang and other leaders to establish the kind of production incentive program that will yield that success. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So we have another presenter. At some
Chair Neal, Senators, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is David O'Reilly. I'm the CEO of the Howard Hughes Corporation, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to support this bill. We've spoke about a number of the benefits of the bill, the creation of a more diverse economy and well-paying jobs, the support of education and vocational training, the generation of economic activity and increased tax revenue. The bill provides ongoing benefits for Nevada's residents and businesses for generations to come, and we unequivocally support it. But I want to spend a minute about why this bill is different. Others have passed poorly constructed incentives without a commitment from production and without a commitment for infrastructure. Credit to Senator Lang and all of the legislatures that have contributed who engaged on the front end, both the world leader in production and proven developers to ensure its success. We don't say if we pass it, they will come. In Nevada, we say it's a certainty. The Howard Hughes Corporation is prepared to execute and deliver the Summerlin Studios project and collaborate with the film industry, as well as our state civic leaders, educational institutions, and business community to ensure the successful realization of this important initiative. Howard Hughes is an $8.4 billion publicly traded company with almost $900 million of cash and restricted cash on our fortress balance sheet. We are one of the country's leading community builders, known for our ability to master plan and develop innovative large-scale communities, small cities, projects that span tens of thousands of acres and take decades to accumulate. I described Howard Hughes specifically as a community builder and not a developer, an important distinction. People hear developer and they think of a company that shows up, buys land, builds a building, sells it, and moves on. That's not us at Howard Hughes. We are an inclusive, sustainable community builder, and we stay, stay for generations, because we're integral to this long-term success of our communities. Summerlin is a perfect example of our strategy and our mission. Today, the community of Summerlin encompasses over 22,500 acres is home to 123,000 residents, three dozen schools, 200 miles of hiking and bike trails, as well as a thriving downtown, including the Las Vegas ballpark. We've been the stewards of Summerlin for over 40 years and will remain involved to ensure its success for another 100. Why? It's not just a project to us. It's our home. Our companies and our employees' success are inextricably linked to the state's success. Our employees live and work in Southern Nevada. Our employees' children go to school there, and we help create the fabric of that community. To that end, we have invested over the past 10 years alone $1.6 billion in Summerlin, and we're prepared, prepared to commit another $700 million today to this project. As a community builder, when we build a project, we're not just building a building or ballpark, a park, a hospital. We're thinking as much about the land around that project and the impact it has on the people that live around that project than the project itself. And this studio project is no different. We always think about the critical questions to ask. Where will the projected 16,000 new employees live? Where will those children go to school? Where will they shop, dine, pray? Summerlin already has a master plan in place that can address all of these questions and accommodate this growth. To that end, the infrastructure is in place to meet that growth. We have sold 3,000 lots to builders to meet the immediate demand for housing. We're installing all the infrastructure, including a reservoir at the top of Summerlin West that will support the next 15 years of residential land growth. We have 123 residents today, but will complete at 200,000, which we are entitled and approved to. Bottom line, we are ready, willing, and able to build the studio project and all of this associated infrastructure to bring this to fruition. My most important responsibility as CEO of the Howard Hughes Corporation is to attract and recruit businesses to come to our regions and support that economic growth in and around our communities. The best part of my job is seeing that come to fruition, to see how our impact can change the lives of our residents and tenants and consumers. I am so excited and humbled to be contributing to this forward-looking vision for Nevada, to help bring homes and jobs while helping to diversify and transform our economy. 
I think of our neighbor in Summerlin who has a catering business and the impact that this will have on her and the entire food service industry. I think of our employee at Howard Hughes and her spouse who drives for the livery service and the impact it'll have for him and the entire transportation industry, just to name a few. I can't wait for the day when I can pull into our Summerlin studio and see it lit up with incredible content that Sony will, will undoubtedly produce. But more importantly, lit up brightening the future, providing thousands of jobs and economic growth and improving the lives of our residents for generations to come. Our company has always taken a long-term generational view and we believe that this act is entirely consistent with that. I'll conclude by thanking you. On behalf of the 300 or so Howard Hughes employees that sit in Summerlin today, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this act, to speak in support of my friends and neighbors, and to speak in support of transforming and bringing to life a resilient and dynamic future for Nevada. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I believe we will call up one last presenter, which is Assemblyman C.H. Miller. Assemblyman C.H. Miller, for the record, uh, thank you, Chair Neal and committee for the time today. Um, I want to start by saying that I am super duper excited about the possibilities uh, that this bill will bring to our state. When we talk about diversification, when we talk about all of the things that everybody else has already said, and I'm sure you're gonna hear a million more times, it's exciting to know that we can incubate and grow a robust film industry right here in the entertainment capital of the world. That's who we are. We need this medium in our state. With that being said, I was super excited again when Senator Lang and Greg Ferraro reached out to me and said, hey, Assemblyman, you are the one with the film background. We need to have you be a part of this bill. And I was excited to be a part of the bill. I've been excited to be a part of all of the meetings and everything that has taken place uh, to bring forward the bill that you, for that you see first. Um, I'm ex also excited to know that Senator Lang and the participants in the bill are open to the amendments that um, we have discussed and we're gonna continue to work on. And that is specifically focused on the independent, for me, the independent filmmaker, the one who doesn't always produce their projects in a major studios. These are the folks whose films fall between maybe the one to $20 million range. A lot of times those projects happen on location outside of studio sites. And so I'm excited to know that we have an opportunity as we continue to work on the mechanics of this bill to bring forward um, a carve out, a, a, a piece that makes this work for them as well. I have um, worked for major studios. I worked for 20th Century Fox Television um, on a show and we had a $1 million episode budget. Uh, about a million and a half, it came out to about 33 million for a season. This was an episodic television show. Um, and so I understand the mechanics of how everything works in the studio, and it's great and exciting because that builds a lot of great jobs. But when I, uh, our, my CEO friend that I have not met yet from Howard Hughes, but I know we got a meeting coming up, he mentioned, he talked about the catering business, right? And so when we talk about the catering businesses and the, the small businesses in our community, that's where the independent studios that are shooting on location in our communities, they are the ones that are frequenting the, the small businesses that are in those spaces. So I am super excited about this bill. I want to see it move forward. I'm excited to continue working with our bill sponsors, with um, UNLV, um, with Howard Hughes, with Sony, with the Bircher Group, to figure out how we're going to uh, build the most robust and inclusive industry for Nevada, where we oftentimes see our black and brown um, film producers able to find themselves legitimately in the business. We know that when you look at Amazon or um, uh, Hulu or Netflix or all of these streaming services, even the things that are popping up on YouTube, 
excuse me, a lot of that is being produced under outside of studio space. And so while we need the infrastructure of studio space to support the big business as well as the small business, we must also be inclusive and mindful of the small business that we um, that we need to grow and incubate because those producers that start with the $100 film, the $100,000 film, the million dollar film, they become the ones producing and directing and um, putting together the $100 million films. And so we need to make sure that we have that um, mindset when we look at something for such a long term in infrastructure uh, development and growth. So with all that being said, I want to say thank you all again for the time. I am again, over the moon to be working on this in my second legislative session, and I'm excited to see it move forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we will, our, uh, Senator Lang. Senator Lang, for the record, I just wanted to close out and say, I just hope that you can see the vision that we see and you can look past and have the strength to look past the number and know what this investment means for our state. And um, with that, we'd like to open to questions. And I'm wondering if there's a way we can add another chair up here so we could have Howard Hughes, Sony, and Bircher up here, because I assume that's where most of the questions are going to go. Yes. So we have an extra chair there that can be rolled over. And uh, Senator Lang, we are hearing what is being said, um, and we recognize that this is a big deal, but we also recognize the balance sheets. <laughs> okay, with that, we will open up for questions. So members, Senator Donate. Thank you so much, Chair Neal. Uh, just want to start off by thanking Senator Lang for bringing this proposal forward. I know it's an exciting time for all of us in this state. Um, I'll try my best not to make my casino references or references to Spider-Man in my line of questioning, but uh, I do have a lot of questions um, that are important and I'll probably stop at some point so that I can allow my other colleagues and then if uh, Chair Neal can come back to me as well. Uh, okay, so first question on page 14 of the presentation. So I'm talking about the slide with film tax credit and infrastructure. Um, it talks about the 190 million per year of total film tax credits. Um, just first basic question for all of us in this committee. How did you arrive to the numbers that you have both for zone one and zone two? Um, are these comparative to uh, what other states have done in terms of tax credits? I, I think it's important for us to understand the context as to how you arrived to these numbers. Yes, um, Brandon Bircher speaking, uh, Chair O'Neill, uh, through you and um, to you if you mind, uh, answer the question. You can just go direct. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator, uh, we looked carefully at the programs throughout the United States that have been successful. The ones most successful, of course, were the ones that insisted on infrastructure. Uh, number two, it was regarding the size of the, uh, the actual annual film tax credits. Um, you'll, you'll look at the competitive sets. There's about 10 states that have programs that are, you know, in the $125 million plus. And as a result, they have been the ones attracting some of the bigger um, programs. Now, um, in addition to that, you have to match infrastructure. And the infrastructure itself, uh, when you look at the by stage uh, content creation, uh, you work backwards into a tax credit incentive. So in the case of the zone one, the 90 million uh, was, was infrastructure oriented in a per stage formula and then remained another 15 million on site for the software providers of the gaming content. Would you add anything to this, um, uh, Sony or her use? I would just suggest that we would need the long-term, um, you know, commitment of funding to fulfill our production obligation of what we talked about as a target of a billion dollars over 10 years. Can you just make sure you state your name for the record Sorry. for the secretary? Thank Michael you. Morgenthal for the record. Thank you. David O'Reilly for the record. Chair Neal through to the senator. I would say that the, the dollar amount 
as, as eloquently answered by Sony, uh, but also as we thought about it, we wanted to make sure that the studio project was vibrant 365 and that we didn't have a dollar amount that provided for a wonderful activation for three or four months and then a ghost town for the rest of the year. And uh, in working with Sony coming up with $80 million, we thought that that would be a, a, a minimum amount candidly that we would be able to keep that content activated and keep our campus full, driving business of the surrounding community the entire year. Great, thank you. And Chair, can I follow up with two more questions? Uh, so, Thank, thank you for that. So I was reviewing the economic and fiscal benefits analysis of this report. Um, in between the different pages and everything, um, quick, just quick clarification because I was getting a little bit confused on following everything along. Is, so I know in, in the report there's like a year one analysis as to what the return on investment would be, et cetera. So just to clarify, what is the first date that the taxpayers and the state would expect for this tax credit to hit. Is it your is your one the fault like this next following year or? Yes, year one is this following year. Um, obviously, the 10 million that's currently in place would be growing to 15. That's immediate. That's the non-infrastructure portion. The infrastructure portion there will be an immediate 40 million available in zone two, and that will uh, bridge that gap for uh, kind of the temporary. Uh, spring type facilities that'll be required to produce while we're building the permitted infrastructure. Okay, thank you so much. And then just last question before, um, so that way my other colleagues can ask questions as well. I'm gonna pivot now to the bill language on page 18. Uh, this is the first time that I see that the amount would be multiplied uh, by the percentage increase in a consumer price index starting on fiscal year 2030 to 2031. Can you talk about the rationale for including the CPI as part of the legislation? Um, I think it'd be helpful for us to understand why that was included. Yes, Senator. Um, the um, impacts of inflation have been so real to the American people this last uh, two or three years, especially to uh, manufacturers and those of us that, that make something. And in the world of filmmaking and producing content, there are costs involved that rise dramatically and have risen dramatically. To keep even with that, to break even through a consumer price index uh, geared towards the Nevada um, CPI number starting in year 2030 and then on an annual basis thereafter. Now, of course, on, from a budget standpoint, um, revenues increase because of other inflationary impacts on the revenue side of the balance sheet of the Nevada organization, if you will. Um, so we think this is an important uh, piece of keeping current those providers for the next 20 years will be providing content. Thank you for that. Any additional questions? Senator Gansert. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome today. Welcome. Um, so I was looking at the numbers as far as the investment. I was looking at Section 10, and uh, when you look at 10, A1, and then I, and, and we're at kind of Roman numeral one and two. Number two talks about the $500 million, but it looks like the $200 million is a sub subdivision or report portion of the $500 million. I just want to make sure that's correct. Senator Ganser, Brandon Bircher. Um, I, um, in that section, you'll note that the first tranche, the first milestone is for zone one to complete 200 million. Mm -hmm. Then there'll be an additional 300 million by 2029 for a total of 500 million. Thank you. And then I, I was looking at the language line 20. It talks about the cost equivalent of land subject to a ground lease. So the investment of 200 million or the cost equivalent. So how do you come up with that? Yeah, it's, it's reversed engineered by the, uh, the, what I'll call the annual return on the ground lease uh, would then intersect with a um, value of the dirt. Okay, and so you're estimating that would still be $200 million? Oh, oh no, the, no, the, the ground is a small piece of the cost of this project. No, the, the, okay, the so construction the cost will actually far exceed the $200 million first hurdle in uh, by 2027. Thank you. So the $200 million is mostly the capital construction piece of it, and then you've got the ground lease, because I was thinking that would be minimal. Yes, too. indeed. I think the value is somewhere around $70 million. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And then 
looking at section 12. Let me see if I can get there. Could you tell me a little bit more about the lead participant? Because you have to designate a lead participant, but I'm not quite sure what that means and if that has to be the same lead participant for each zone or if they're for different zones. Yes, Brandon Bircher. Uh, Senator, the lead participant could be an individual of, zo of zone one or zone two. It could also be a, an entity uh, representing an organization. Um, th that was the intent in the drafting. Thank you. And then did I see that if you designate a lead participant, then that individual or entity has to be that part of the lead for five years? Did I read that? or? No. You know, th that is a really good question. I don't know whether we have addressed how long that participant, I, I'm sure that the intent would be for each zone to be able to mature as the project goes forward, uh, identifying either that entity or, or individual that would be speaking on behalf of that zone. Um, thank you. And then when I was looking at the uh, transferable tax credits, it looks like there were three types that just to confirm, there's modified business tax, insurance premium tax and the gaming license fee, but not like gross gaming, it's a gaming license fee? Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So um, <laughs> uh, this is uh, Brian Fernley, um, committee counsel. Um, so the gaming license fee is the uh, monthly uh, fee imposed on gaming licensees that's based on their gross gaming revenue. Gross gaming. Okay, same thing. All right, thank you. I know I'm asking you all the technical questions, right? Um, and then I didn't understand, I wasn't sure what, um, there wasn't a definition that I could see, the below the line personnel versus above the line personnel, maybe you could help me with that too. Michael Morgenthal for the record, uh, Chair Neal through to you, Senator. Um, we distinguish above the line uh, versus below the line. Uh, above the line is usually um, producers, director, actors, and below the line is the transportation department, the construction department, set dressing. It's, it's the, um, typically the, the unionized workforce. Um, thank you, that is helpful. And then I think the last question I have is around section 30 when it talks about the money that is um, set aside for the system of higher education, and it says 45% of that goes to the Nevada Media Lab, and the 55 goes towards the workforce development, and it points to Section 32, but I wasn't really, there wasn't a lot of definition around Section 34 and workforce development, so maybe you could give me an idea of, of um, that 55% in the workforce development. Yes, thank you, Brandon Bircher, for the record. Um, the 100% uh, is approximately, that is at 3% of the mm -hmm. 30. And as a result, uh, that's about a $19, $20 million a year. 45% is to run and operate and hire the personnel and buy the equipment at the media lab, which will be the home to the uh, grammar schools all the way through higher education that don't have facilities to be able to use, providing that programming. The other 55% is to go out into the community, every portion of the state of Nevada, that would then have the board of seven, which is in this uh, section as well, um, that would oversee uh, a plan that would be created to actually envision how that would be generated. You're going to hear from somebody in a moment, Dale Marsden, uh, of Talent of Tomorrow, who's worked with us uh, in this area, so we can have more color around that, if you don't mind. Um, thank you, that would be helpful. So the first 45% is really to run the lab, which is under the system of higher education, and then the other 55% is develop, it sounds like a plan that would be statewide, and then you're gonna provide more information. Uh, to be clear, the 45% uh, uh, is not for the higher education, it's for all education. That 100% that of the f account is for all people of the state of Nevada, and it's just what is going to be dedicated to the structure so that we could support the finest, uh, laboratory for generations to come, uh, bar none in the in the in the U.S. And that's really been the the vision for that piece. Thank you. Thank you for that, Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Ling. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, uh, Senator Ling and team. Uh, I was wondering, um, I like the idea of tax credits and um, allowing for a robust industry as well as investment in infrastructure. Uh, will these companies who are making the films be subject to the commerce tax? Could we um, have the assistance of uh, Brian uh, Fernley? 
Yes. Thank you. Mr. Farley. Uh, thank you. Um, so to be subject to the commerce tax, the entity would be engaging in business in Nevada. So it sounds like these production companies would have some business activity in Nevada. And currently, the commerce tax would apply to uh, those entities that have uh, business activity in Nevada that generates uh, more than $4 million of gross revenue um, from Nevada activity. So to the extent that the entities are engaging in business in Nevada and that activity in Nevada generates $4 million, of, or $4 million or more of gross revenue, then that would trigger commerce tax liability. Thank you. And did you want to add anything? Or? No, I couldn't okay. possibly do better. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, there's a lot of talk about hiring Nevadans. And um, as at least that's where I see some of the pushback. Uh, so is, is there a percentage of Nevadans in which will be hired as far as workforce? Let me approach it from two ways. Uh, Brandon Birch, and then I might call upon Michael from Sony. Um, the intent, obviously, is to have a very robust workforce that is um, grown indigenously here in, in the state of Nevada. And it begins at grammar schools uh, where people uh, get that vision, that passion. And, um, and we see that over time there's going to be a really deep bench of a variety of talents that we've heard about today. Um, the uh, intent of the bill's language is to disincentivize people from not hiring at least 50% of people in state and, and organizations that support these films. So there's a 2% reduction of the 30% possible tax credit. Uh, Michael, would there be anything more to add to that? Michael Morgenthal, for the record. Our goal is always to hire local. Um, it, it's, we save money, uh, we don't pay for hotels or per diems and, and travel. Uh, so as, uh, as Brandy pointed out, uh, our, you know, we're disincentivized, but also it's our goal just as a business model as we, as we do in other states. Thank you so much. Um, also, I know that housing's an issue. I see that you have that sort of covered with Howard Hughes coming on board as a partner. Uh, water's an issue um, here in our state. So I just put that on record as just some concerns to think about. But thank you all for your presentation. It was very thorough and I look forward to supporting the bill. David O'Reilly, for the record, Chair uh, Neal, through to the center, Buck. The land that we've allocated here in Summerlin for this product has always been commercial and it has the necessary water to support this. And of all the potential commercial uses for the site, movie production is the least intrusive on existing water supplies. So we think this is a win-win from that perspective. All right, members, any additional questions? Okay, so I have a couple. Um, I want in section 11 of the bill, this has the election piece. If you could just explain and break down um, how the election will work. Brandon Bircher. Um, Chair Neal, I think the election you're talking about, is it relating to the uh, decision of a 2030 I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, so in section 11, it's the election made be made pursuant to the subsection is binding on the project for four for five years, on which the election is made. So it has to do with this establishing not later than 24 months the development agreement and how the lead participant of the Las Vegas Media Campus project may make an election on whether another production company located can um, access the film infrastructure transferable credit. Yes, it's, it's an election that occurs uh, every five years is the intent. And um, the idea here is that you have various types of productions that are going to be occurring in the state. Uh, some are gonna be sponsored by a zone owner slash production organization, or you'll have people that actually speculatively develop those 
um, facilities as in zone one for a variety uh, of other types of uh, content creators. And so those elections will be made uh, within 24 months of the commencement of this um, activity period after the development agreement with GOAT is signed, giving us that optionality to determine probably more for the benefit of zone one because uh, we will be determining the type and style of productions occurring in that zone versus I think Sony already has a good vision of what they have in zone two. Thank you for that. And then next question, section 16, subsection three. This is on the carry, for, carry forward provisions. If you can um, break that down for the committee in terms of structurally how it will work. Right, I, I'm gonna say that this probably is one of the areas that um, Greg Ferraro was referring to where we'll be having further discussions about the detail on because I want to make sure that Sony and uh, the Howard Hughes Group and Birch are, are on the same page as will be the, some of the other stakeholders here today. Um, this is about um, making sure that there is a cap. We're very sensitive to the fact that the budget is going to have a, um, an accounting mechanism that's going to put on your balance sheet an amount of money. And, um, you know, I, I can't profess to completely be able to give a lesson in how that might work, but there are revenue generating future occurrences and there's obligations in the future that the state will have. So what we're attempting to do here is have a rollover cap of the 50% of the unused tax credit from the previous year will, will, will roll forward to the following year only. It's a one year roll forward plus that existing year's 190 million. So we're attempting to, to put a cap on this so there isn't a, a, a day and time where all of a sudden all of this pent up unused credits would be cashed in at once and put the state in jeopardy. But as I said, this is something we're gonna to wanna to refine together further in the amendment. Thank you for that. And then my next question is on section 21. Uh, this is related to the non-infrastructure transferable credits. If you could explain that for the record because there's several parts to that. Yeah, the, the section regarding, and there are quite a few sections in this bill that relate to the existing uh, 10 million that's now going to become 15. Uh, the non-infrastructure portion is available to any production statewide. And uh, they follow the same rules as the productions uh, do in the infrastructure zone. And if I could make an attempt, Michael, um, I'll be humbled in your presence to, to try so. But um, what happens is, is that a production will come to the, uh, to the zone um, director, an individual of record, if you will, and say, I'd like to go to GoEd and request X million for tax credits. And that zone will then approve that, uh, going to GoEd and filling out the forms for a qualified, a pre-qualified film. Or, or content creation. Then the content's created over the you know, course of months or year following, and following the production, it goes back to GoEd with an audit uh, performed. At that time, the tax credits are then issued uh, if, upon that successful audit. So it's a accountability, if you will. Um, they follow those same rules, it, whether they're infrastructure or non-infrastructure. Did that answer your question, Chair Neal? It did, and so, Keeping that in mind, and if you look at section 22, subsection three, this is, it, it relates um, discussion on the non-infrastructure transferable tax credits as approved by the office, where it says that it must be reduced by 2% um, between July 1st of 2023 and July 1st, 2043, mm -hmm. if less than 50% of the below line personnel of the qualified production are Nevada residents. So mechanically, right, talk about how that works within the audit. So you're expecting GoEd to audit that particular provision to make sure that um, this 50% threshold is met. Michael Morgenthal for the record, Chair Neal. Uh, the, the process, we use a third party auditor is my understanding of the current program that- Well, I'm talking about GoEd. Governor's so, office. Well, the third party auditor presents to GOED, 
And in that process, I would uh, expect that they would analyze the uh, resident versus non-resident labor. And my understanding that's based on a uh, aggregate spend, my understanding. Um, and they would go through that audit process, present it to go out, who would have an opportunity to review that audit. Okay. I was just trying to get an idea of mechanically how it worked because it says, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a clawback because basically it says it must be reduced by 2% if these things don't occur. Um, and then I have a question on section 23, which then talks about this 15 million piece. Um, and so this is, this is the non-infrastructure tax credit but it's relating to any portion of the 15 million per fiscal year. And so if you can talk about how that will work mechanically in this project. Chair Neal, just to clarify, the, it's not a, it, I don't expect it would be a clawback because we're not actually awarded the credits until after the audit's completed. Just so, Okay, so you're, so you're mentioning for section 22. So, so the way I read it, Section 22 basically says that um, the tax credits approved by the office must be reduced by 2% between basically a 20-year threshold if less than 50% of the below-line personnel of the qualified production are Nevada residents. And so the clarification is that the reduction is in the amount of the film infrastructure transferable tax credits uh, pursuant to the subsection. Um, so if it's not a clawback, then how, so talk to me about the reduction is going to happen over a 20 year period if folks, if 50% of the residents are not hired. So there's a 20 year window to make sure that Nevada residents work. No, um, that's what I'm like. Yeah, yeah. No, no. What this is meant to to <laughs> do in in its conventional in the industry is that at that audit moment, no one has received a certificate authorizing an amount yet, and in that audit, after certifying that they truly are residents, and that the subcontractors truly are local subcontractors, all the criteria that's part of this, will then um, either pass or fail in that situation at the determination of GOED and through that discussion with the applicant, and then the 2% is either deducted or not deducted. And then the tax credit is awarded at the end. Got it, thank you for that. Okay, um, and I only have one question, and I believe this is on section 30, which was brought up before on the account. So, I. The account is created, but I think, have you guys figured out how to uh, monetize the credits so that money actually goes into the account? Have you figured that part out? Uh, this is Brandon Bircher, uh, Chair Neal. Uh, yes, we've had discussions about how that works, and um, I'm assured that uh, we will be pleased with the fact that uh, when the uh, Board of Seven uh, have approved an expenditure uh, on the bill uh, 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 from that account that the cash would be deposited into that account itself. And as a result, um, how it gets there, I'm going to probably let the finance and fiscal department d deal with that. Okay. Um, okay. Member, uh, Mr. Nagamoto, do you want to? I don't think this is something you can weigh in on because. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so are there any additional questions? Uh, Senator Dunyat. Thank you so much, Chair Neal. Um, so with regards to, um, I'm trying to keep track of like the, the reductions that are in the bill and then the refund. So in section 12 and section 21 of the bill it talks about the refund for a production company and I believe this is a provision that we have yet to see. So can you describe to us what the refund process is um, and why that is put in the bill? I think that the, the rationale is important for us to understand. 
Y yes. Um, look at what, uh, Brandon Bircher for the record, Senator. Um, what we initially were attempting to do, when a f tax credit is issued to a production, um, it either can be, uh, it will first be trickled through the taxes owed by that entity, and then there'll be a, to the extent there's a difference between what that entity has already used from their own tax liabilities and the amount of the tax credit. So there could be a gap of yet to be used tax credits. You could um, receive a refund, if you will, or a, or a cash payment. This is something that California has done. Many states are doing this. Um, you might be able to t share that a little more deeply there, Michael. But um, I think what we're discussing now is that um, this idea of a refund would actually be eliminated, thus only having the two options. The tax credit could be used by the production completely, or it could sell it at a discount uh, to somebody that can. And that would liquefy uh, and create a cash event for the holder of that certificate. Michael. Michael Morgenthal, for the record. Chair Neal, through to you, Senator Dignate. Uh Yes, our understanding is the amendment language will address the refundability language to transferability, is our understanding. Thank you. And just to follow up, can you speak about the re if this practice is enacted in other states? I know Mr. Bircher alluded to it, but what states have it, has that provision of the bill been enacted in, and how does it? I, I can speak to the general transferability concept uh, is in uh, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and uh, I'm not mentioning all of them, but some states that have high production volume. Thank you. And Chair, if I may, for a follow-up question. Um, you know, we talked about indie film projects, and I'm aware that you have a um, potential amendment if you can discuss on that. I think um, from some of the concerns that I've received uh, from constituents, et cetera, you know, there's a, we want to make sure that if there are indie film productions or smaller organizations that want to be able to access these t tax credits that we're about to pass, that they have the ability to do so. I mean, uh, you know, there's a fear that we're, we're passing these tax credits for multi-billion dollar corporations, but the small guys being left behind. So can you speak to the amendment that you guys are proposing and how to make sure that everyone is being encompassed in this proposal? Of course, David O'Reilly, for the record, Chair Neal, through to you, Senator. Look, I, I, I said it earlier, and I, I'll re repeat it, that our goal here, both for Howard Hughes and Bircher, is to create studio facilities that are going to be filled year-round. And suffice to say, despite Sony's billion-dollar commitment, which I still struggle to say is pretty amazing, there's more studio space that will be developed between the $500 million project in Zone 1 and the $400 million project in Zone 2 that can accommodate Sony and Universal and Columbia and a number of independent film companies that would like to do production. At the end of the day, any company that wants to do production can come and apply for those credits, and it's our job to find them space to film. And I think that to say that there's X dollars for zone one, Y dollars for zone two, and Z dollars for independent films, I don't think is an accurate representation because I think independent films can be done in all three buckets. It's just a matter of where they apply and where they choose to film. And then uh, just my, my final question. I know I saw it in section 14, but I just wanted to clarify. So I know there's a precedent in the bill that deals with making sure that a portion of the jobs are going back to Nevada residents, et cetera. Um, has there been any consideration as to making sure, so in other provisions and other bills that we're seeing, um, there's commitments towards equity and inclusion, making sure that the contractors that you're hiring are, um, you know, uh, BIPOC populations, women-owned, veteran-owned, et cetera. So does that, does, does that template exist anywhere in this bill, and is, is there a commitment to at least put that as part of the revisions as part of the amendment process, if it doesn't exist yet? Uh, Brandon Bircher, Senator. Um, yeah, absolutely, uh, the, the, the whole concept here in the account with the education and vocational fund is to bring these young people of all ages into a new industry that is going to create deep tap roots into the state of Nevada for generations to come. And they have to be 
broadly distributed. And that's the exciting part of the board that's going to be overseeing this fund. Number two, in the bill, um, we have included language that uh, discusses the importance of DEI. In fact, I believe the language we've picked is the model from, from the state of Illinois. Well, and Mr. Bridger, just to clarify, so, but that's the pipeline of the students that will go into these careers, but I'm referring back to when the groundbreaking exists, will there be a priority for the diversity and equity provisions that we have enacted in other projects similar to this one once the groundbreaking starts? I think that's more so. Yeah, as yeah. you know, there's the 40 million in zone two and the 15 immediately available, 55 total immediately. And what we're going to be doing is working obviously with uh, uh, Assemblyman Miller and uh, the chair and others uh, regarding the refinement of these issues because we aren't really sure if we uh, have all the details in place clearly enough to make sure that, that it achieves the objectives of the state of Nevada. Thank you for that. Um, so I know Senator Spearman just came. I don't know. Do you, did you have any questions on this bill? Well, I'll say no. Okay. So <laughs> we we are going to have Mr. Nakamoto um, break down um, zone one and zone two in regards to the tax credits. So is, I believe we're done with questions unless Senator Spearman decides she has one. Um, but if not, we're done asking questions on the bill specifically. Um, we do, for the folks watching and the folks down at Grant Sawyer, want to break down uh, the zone one and zone two in regards to the tax credits because we do have visual learners on our committee um, and also in our viewing audience. So we're gonna have Mr. Nakamoto break down a table that is in Nellis. So in Nellis, you're gonna see a table that says table one overview of the film tax proposal. And so it is gonna, Mr. Tower is gonna go and pull it up on the screen. And then Mr. Nakamoto is gonna go over it. And then we'll close out the presentation and then open up for support. Thank you guys for our having, answering all of our questions. I don't think we were very hard on you guys. Oh, I don't. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Michael Nakamoto. I'm a Chief Principal Deputy Fiscal Analyst with the Fiscal Analysis Division of the Legislative Council Bureau. And while Mr. Tower is bringing up uh, this table, which is in Nellis, um, I'll just do a brief overview. There are actually three tables that were prepared by Fiscal Analysis Division staff with the usual reminder that we are nonpartisan staff for the Legislative Council Bureau and for the committee. Uh, we do not support or oppose legislation, um, but this information was put together um, primarily for us to get a bearing on uh, the proposal um, that is in front of the committee today, um, but um, also for the members of the committee as well as the public. Um, there are, for the, uh, the, mem or the members of the audience who are in the room here in Carson City, there are paper copies at the back of the table. Again, it is also available in Nellis. Um, there are three tables that are, um, uh, that are in Nellis. Um, the other two have to do with that carry, the carry forward provisions contained within the bill, um, but the chair has asked me to specifically go through table one, which lays out um, the overview of the tax credits and basically um, based on the provisions of the bill when these may um, hit the, uh, the revenue sheets um, for the state. And, um, one of the things that I'll note is um, one of my other roles here with the Fiscal Analysis Division, in addition to uh, staffing this committee, um, is uh, I serve as staff to the Economic Forum. And, and um, essentially, the Economic Forum is required as part of its duties to provide forecasts for these uh, tax credits similar to this, including the existing film tax program. And so the way that they are accounted for uh, as part of that process is basically they're treated as revenue, and specifically they're treated as negative revenue. 
So um, if this bill were to pass, um, there would have to be, uh, in essence, negative revenue put on the sheets to account for these tax credits. So um, with the table up now, um, I'll go through, and basically we've broken it down into three uh, particular categories. And the first one um, is labeled as the non-infrastructure transferable tax credits. Uh, and this is the existing program that is amended as part of this bill. Um, uh, as a matter of a little bit of background, um, the existing film tax credit program in its current state was put into place by the legislature in Assembly Bill 492 of the 2017 session, um, authorizing the Office of Economic Development, or GOED, uh, to issue $10 million of uh, transferable tax credits for eligible film productions uh, per fiscal year, um, and this is a permanent program. So this has been in place since FY 2018, and so in that first uh, column, um, that you can see there that says existing law, this is the $10 million as it carries forward. Uh, Section 23 of Senate Bill 496 authorizes an additional $5 million per fiscal year to be added to this particular pot of these, so, uh, the, what is now deemed to be the non-infrastructure transferable tax credits, and this will occur between uh, FY 2024 and FY 2043 under the provisions of the bill, and so then you get to that final column, which is the total, is the sum of those two pieces that you can see it increases from 10 million to 15 million for that 20-year period, and then beginning in FY 2044 reverts to $10 million per fiscal year. Uh, the CPI adjustment factor, I'll come back to that, um, that next column, it has been discussed as part of the testimony, um, but what I'll do is I'll move to the Las Vegas Media Campus, which is uh, zone one. And specifically the provisions of the bill, and this is specifically um, section 16, subsection one, paragraph A, require um, zone one to have um, $200 million in capital investment, as was discussed, including the, the value of the land, um, on or before December 31st, 2027. And for what basically, what I should note here is there are a host of assumptions that were made um, by fiscal analysis division staff in putting this estimate together. Um, the assumptions basically that we made are that zone one and zone two were going to meet these deadlines and trigger the requirements for these on the date that is specified. It could happen before that, and in, in all likelihood, given the testimony today, it will happen before that. But just to put something on paper based on what we knew when we put this together looking at the bill, we just thought, let's use the date that they have to meet this by. So if they meet that, uh, 200 million in capital investment on or before December 31st, 2027, they automatically become eligible for an authorization of $55 million in transferable tax credits uh, that day. Um, so that puts $55 million of credits um, that become available in FY 2028. The next hurdle that they would have to meet is that cumulative $500 million on or before December 31st, 2029. So $300 million above that initial investment. And so again, using the assumption that they would hit that amount on December 31st, 2029, realizing that in the real world it can and likely will happen sooner than that, but for this exercise they meet it that day, then that $55 million goes to $95 million and that occurs in FY 2030. Uh, in FY 2031, pursuant to section 16, subsection 2 of the bill, that's when the CPI adjustment comes in. And the, the way that that works is um, the amount of the credit beginning in FY 2031 for both Zone 1 and Zone 2 are increased by the, cha uh, the percentage change of inflation uh, using the consumer price index, all items for the Western region. Um, between July 2027 and the July immediately preceding the fiscal year for which that change occurs. So for FY 2031, it would be the change between July 2027 and July 2029, uh, which you can see there, uh, based on the assumptions that we used, um, we uh, subscribe to Moody's Analytics and we use their forecasts for consumer price index and so on. We don't have a Western region forecast from Moody's Analytics. We use the, the US one. Um, it's not gonna be an exact analog, but um, to just get some numbers in a sheet so that people could look at them, we used the West, uh, and it's somewhere in that 
between two and three percent, between uh, depending on the fiscal year, and which is uh, the way that um, staff looked at it is kind of a reasonable um, weight um, or rate of inflation. So in that first year, there would be a 4.3 percent increase to the credits um, from 95 million, and so it, we would add that 4 million 39 thousand. And I and these are rounded numbers because typically we just round things to the nearest thousand. So in FY 2031, the credit would be approximately 99. Uh, million dollars for zone one. And then you could see going forward for the uh, increase all the way to FY 2048. And so the reason why FY 2048 got uh, chosen as uh, the date is because there are provisions in the bill that say that no credits can be approved by GOED um, in any fiscal year that begins uh, more than 20 years after that initial, um, initial capital investment for Zone 1 um, happens. So uh, with the assumption that they meet that initial capital investment on December 31st, 2027, the last fiscal year that they would be eligible to have an allocation of credits would be the fiscal year beginning on June 1st, 2047, or July 1st, 2047, which is FY 2048. It's the last fiscal year that begins uh, less than 20 years before that anniversary date. And so it goes through and does this calculation. And so by the time you get to the end um, in that final fiscal year, based on the assumptions that we have, the amount of credits that would be available for zone one would be just short of $147.1 million for an aggregate amount of credits over this period of uh, $2,378,338,000. Again, this is based on the assumptions that we have. Uh, so moving on to zone two, um, the provisions are slightly different, um, as was discussed by um, the uh, testimony on uh, zone two as opposed to zone one. Uh, under the provisions of uh, section 16, um, subsection one, paragraph B of uh, the bill, zone two is eligible for an immediate $40 million allocation of credits per fiscal year. And, and actually, let me rephrase it as not immediate. They need to sign the development agreement with GOED, and that has to happen within 20, 120 days after July 1st, 2023. So that is expected then to happen in FY 2024. Based on the provisions of the bill, um, they would immediately become eligible for $40 million in credits. And so that carries forward all the way in on this sheet um, until FY 2030. There are steps that need to occur in between then um, in order to maintain their eligibility for that $40 million allocation. They'll have to meet that initial $150 million of capital investment on or before December 31st, 2027. And then to um, continue and actually receive an increased allocation. They'll have to um, have an additional capital investment of $250 million to make a total capital investment of $400 million on or before December 31st, 2029. Um, and for the, uh, the sake of the, uh, the table here, we have that occurring in FY 2030, but that again is something that could happen before that. Um, and so um, the rest of the table uh, functions similarly. Um, that their CPI adjustment using that same methodology and f um, formula occurs beginning in FY 2031. And then their final year is also tied to that 20 year anniversary of zone one. So zone one and zone two end at the same time based on the provisions of the bill. Um, and so it, when you get to FY 2048, which in this scenario is the last number, or the last fiscal year in which they could receive credits, uh, it would be uh, one, uh, about $123.8 million per fiscal year for a cumulative amount of credits in this scenario of $2,150,182,000. Um, over the, the span of 25 fiscal years. Um, so then the last two columns on this uh, 
on this table um, are the total film tax credits that would be available, uh, both infrastructure and non-infrastructure. So it's those non-infrastructure credits um, plus zone one and zone two um, per fiscal year. Um, so the to bottom line on that over the period is $4,878,520,000 uh, over 25 years. And then that last credit is just the uh, increment that is added by this bill. So it's basically taking that total for each fiscal year and subtracting the existing $10 million under uh, current law. So the total incremental credits that result from the passage of SB 496, if it were approved, uh, would be $4,628,520,000 uh, um, over 25 years, again, using the assumptions we set for. Forth. The, the actual amount over the 25 years is obviously going to depend on what the rate of inflation is when these projects come online because that's going to determine the length that they are available. But based on the information that we have and just using the assumptions that the projects are going to meet the capital investment on the date specified in the bill as the deadline, um, this is uh, the information that, I, uh, that we had put together for the committee uh, and for the public for their consideration. Thank you. Uh, for thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Nakamoto. Any questions to Mr. Nakamoto before we move on? All right, so um, I wanted to make sure that, you know, for our visual learners, you could see the breakdown of the numbers. And with that, we will go ahead and open up for support for SB 496. Yeah. All right. You Good. Can, so, could you just spell your last name for the secretary so we don't mess it up? But go, go ahead. Yes, Senator. Good afternoon, Senator Neal and esteemed committee members. I'm Dale Marsden, M A R S D E N, with Tomorrow's Talent. I've served in public education for, I'm in support of this bill. I've served in public education for over 30 years and most recently as superintendent of San Bernardino City Unified School District, one of our country's largest and most diverse districts where 90% of our students are traditionally marginalized and live in poverty. Yet during our eight year tenure together, our team was able to see our graduation rates grow from 66.8% to 93.6%, surpassing state, county, and national averages. We saw a doubling of students eligible for college and a growth of five to 53 pathways in high demand, high wage fields, culminating with experiences that connect students to the real world of work through paid internships before stepping foot off the graduation stage to enter professional trade, college, or career. Additionally, my family boasts multiple generations of hay farmers and an honorable veteran of the Vietnam War in this great state. Each of their experiences has taught them the kind of grit and hard work it takes to build a life where they can live unmolested and provide for themselves and their families. However, during their lifetimes, they've seen the advances of technology transform a farm to a point where just two people can manage 360 acres well into their 80s. They've also seen how this industry and so many others have struggled to remain viable for future generations. Bircher Development Group has teamed up with my company, Tomorrow's Talent, a veteran-owned and woman-led company through the proposed Nevada Education Vocational Fund to bridge the gap between education and industry that currently leaves 53% of college graduates under or unemployed, and employers overwhelmingly dissatisfied with the readiness of young employees in the workforce. Closing this gap from our rural schools to large urban areas is key to Nevada diversifying its economy and reshaping the workforce system. More than 100 years of combined experience gives Tomorrow's Talent team a distinct understanding of what it takes to bridge the world of education to the real world of work. Starting as early as elementary school, students will learn in the workplace through job tours, internships, pre-apprenticeships, apprenticeships in the film industry, including every specialty from actors to camera operators, game designers to programmers, set designers to costume builders, as well as the intersection of technologies from artificial intelligence to augmented reality to cybersecurity that impacts this diverse field. Together we can build not just a physical space for the future of Nevada's economic growth, but the kind of place where once again grit and hard work can help to our future generations provide for themselves and their families. We believe at Tomorrow's Talent and connecting local talent to local employers to grow the local economy. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
Uh, next, um, I just want to remind everybody it will be two minutes. Um, I'm going to let everyone who's standing up. I don't know why you're standing up. It's just very strange behavior to me. Um, <laughs> I guess you're just like, I have a plane to catch. I don't know what's happening. Um, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'll start with my jokes, but it is strange. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Vince Saavedra, for the record. Vince, V-I-N-C-E, Saavedra, S-A-A-V-E-D-R-A. -A -A. I'm the Executive Secretary Treasurer to the Southern Nevada Building Construction Trade Unions. Um, first, I want to thank both um, companies for uh, making their promise to work with us and pay area standards to the construction workers on, uh, on the projects in the South. Um, and for those reasons, and working closely with them to secure a project labor uh, agreement on this job. Uh, Southern Nevada Building Trades is in full support. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you, Chairwoman Neal and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Susie Martinez, and I am the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And on behalf of over 150,000 members and more than 120 unions, which include union workers in both the building and construction trades, as well as the service industry, the Nevada State AFL-CIO proudly supports Senate Bill 496, also known as the Nevada Film Studio Infrastructure Act. As we continue to rebuild our economy after the pandemic, it is essential that we strengthen our workforce by creating new jobs throughout our industries. We have a unique opportunity to fundamentally change and promote economic development opportunities through Senate Bill 496. Building the foundation for permanent studio infrastructure in Las Vegas will not only make us competitive with other states with regards to the production of major films and episodic television, but also create thousands of good paying union jobs in both the construction and service industry. This legislation is exactly what we need to build a tourism economy of the future and support union workers in our state. I was born here in Las Vegas and I'm really proud to say we have amazing communities, we have a robust gaming industry, we have amazing sport teams, and now film. We, I mean, it's amazing the things that are happening in our state. Thank you very much. We support the bill. Okay. Thank you for that. Next. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Constance Brooks, Vice President of Government and Community Engagement for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. With me today, also from UNLV, are Dr. Marta Miana, former President and Strategic Advisor to President Whitfield, Dr. Warren Cobb, UNLV Associate Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Film Professor, and last but certainly not least, the star of our contingent this afternoon is Mr. Corbin Lopez, who as of this past Saturday is a recent graduate of the UNLV College of Fine Arts film program. In January of this year, the UNLV Research Foundation Board of Directors unanimously agreed to enter into a 100-year ground lease with the Bircher Development that will feature a Las Vegas media campus UNLV integration and benefits program as was previously explained. UNLV is aligned with the vision of Bircher in their desire to connect with and support the next generation of filmmakers, content developers, and technocrats. The Las Vegas media campus at the UNLV Harry Reid Research Park will allow for great strides in workforce development, college completion, and collaborative endeavors with a growing technology-driven arts industry to be realized. These are efforts that will undoubtedly benefit our students, our faculty, and our flourishing campus community. We are in full support of SB 496. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next. For the record, uh, Dr. Marta Mian, M-A-R-T-A, M-E-A-N-A. -A. Good afternoon, Chair Neal and members of the Senate Committee on Revenue. I sit before you in my capacity as strategic advisor to UNLV President Keithy Whitfield on STEM and STEAM education and career development. Now, in my previous role as interim president of UNLV, I had the privilege of breaking ground on the first building at the UNLV Harry Reid Research and Technology Park, so it is really gratifying for me to consider the unparalleled opportunities that the Nevada Film Studio Infrastructure Act would present. 
it aligns seamlessly with the economic and research development mission of our research park and with the educational and workforce development mission of UNLV. And it presents multiple opportunities to a number of our programs and colleges. Obviously, the most obvious one is the College of Fine Arts and our wonderful film department. But having world-class facilities and access to industry professionals Studios and sound stages aside, the digital content creation component of the Las Vegas, Las Vegas Media Campus directly speaks to our programs in graphic arts, engineering, computer science, medicine, and gaming, uh, just to name some. We worked very hard on an integration agreement um, with uh, the Bircher Group that we're very excited about because, of course, uh, living on our park, we want to make sure um, that it fulfills our educational mission. That's why we have that research park. And we are very excited about the rent-free office space, the devotion of a full-time program director whose sole uh, responsibility um, will be to make sure that that integration happens and that results in internships and career opportunities for our students. Um, then, of course, the, the utilization of, of these incredible facilities. So I know we have to be um, brief, but in closing, we could not be in more support of this. It is, uh, it is an incredible opportunity for our students, for our faculty, and for our community. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Next. For the record, Tom Worley representing Laborers Local 872, Laborers Local 169, and the Communication Workers of America. This is a bill, it's about jobs and it's about economic diversification for the community and we support, thank you. Thank you for that. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Warren D. Cobb and I'm Associate Chair of the UNLV Film Department. This bill directly affects our program as our students need more opportunities for on-the-job learning. We often must send our students to LA or other production centers for specialized training and internships, resulting in prohibitive travel and prohibitive lodging expenses, missed courses, missed work, and broken leases on Las Vegas rentals. This also forces our students to step away from collegial networks that they have worked hard to develop. Our students find it prohibitive to leave Las Vegas for three or four months at a time for a physically distant internship. This career placement challenge results in us losing dozens of industry opportunities for our students each semester. The potential of this impact bill will also reach far beyond UNLV's film department. The film industry is an art, a craft, and a business, and therefore depends upon support from multiple areas of expertise. Other academic units, such as theater, music, art, hospitality, and business will also be closely engaged. Additionally, there will also be rich opportunities for research and development in management, accounting, economics, marketing, and emerging technologies. That is definitely not all. Our department will grow as we will now have an exponentially better chance at attracting top students from around the world. We'll be able to expand graduate education by an order of magnitude. Our students will have consistent access to industry mentors, guest expert lecturers, and professional studio facilities. We will be able to expand and deepen our curriculum to cover industry critical areas that we simply cannot cover at this moment. We love film and want nothing more than to create an amazing workforce. It will be our honor and our privilege. I can continue, but in the interest of time, I'll close. Please help us become a film education destination. Now I'll turn it over to our UNLV film student, Corbin Lopez. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and the members of the committee. It's an honor to be here. For the record, my name is Corbin J. Lopez. I am a new graduate of the UNLV film program, as well as a filmmaker and an artist. I hope I can express how critically the Nevada Film Studio Infrastructure Act will not only change my life, but the lives of those in my community and the state that I call home. This bill will pave an unparalleled path within the film industry within Nevada for the film community here and for UNLV film students just like me. Rather than having to look outwards for opportunities to get our foot in the door and run off to LA or New York with nothing but $20 and a dream, this bill will knock the door right off the hinges for us right here in our own state. 
While most prefer to only experience Vegas on Friday than get out by Sunday, calling this bright city home creates a completely unique and unconventional experience that fosters artistic communities across the valley that are deeply driven and eclectically expressive. By providing permanency for the film industry here in Southern Nevada, artists across Vegas, such as me and my peers at UNLV Film, will have greater opportunities to open up to grow and to truly thrive. As the LV film community does not have as much uh, access to resources and jobs as universities located within hubs for the film production, this has only driven us to work harder and make bold swings of self-expression. Founding the Las Vegas Media Campus Project at UNLV will directly enable the next generation of talent and passion to gain active, hands-on experience and training that will directly shift the film industry. The creativity that has come out of UNLV Film is a true, true reflection of the Nevada and Las Vegas spirit and represents what could be with the opportunities created by this bill. Vegas is so intrinsically and extraordinarily diverse. I've met people and experienced cultures from all over the globe, all at home in Nevada, from Lebanon to Vietnam, from Ethiopia to Puerto Rico, to my place of origin, North Las Vegas, to shining LGBT communities and beyond. Through the lens of equity, this bill will set the stage for voices that have so often been underrepresented in film and finally empower them to step into the spotlight. By passing the Nevada Film Studio Infrastructure Act, by keeping and creating jobs here, it enables us to really innovate, persevere, and flourish in the way that the people of Las Vegas always have. I'm a rarity in that I was born and raised in Vegas, so home has always meant Nevada for me. But if this bill passes, home can mean Nevada for the film industry and the film community as well. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Randy Saltero with Saltero Strategies. And, and Corbin, I am also a homegrown uh, Nevadan uh, from North Las Vegas. And uh, I appreciate that you're going to be here to, to hopefully be able to uh, grow not your job, but a career uh, here in Nevada. Um, Madam Chair, in 2017, I've been in this building a long time. Uh, in 2017, with Senator Ford and Assemblywoman Carlton, uh, we did the first film bill that was uh, here enacted in the state of Nevada. Uh, it was a, a program that was started to kind of introduce film tax credits, transferable uh, film tax, tax credits uh, to the state of Nevada and to see if they'd work. Um, I can tell you that when we passed that bill and the things that happened after that, when, when we experienced a, a cut in those tax credits with the Tesla program and, and re, uh, got some of those credits back, uh, all along we envisioned um, attracting infrastructure or having a studio here. That has always been kind of the dream of what, you know, when, when Senator Ford and Assemblywoman Carlton and, and others that are here in this room today thought about when we did this first uh, film tax credit bill here in the state. And then fast forward to 2021, I, I met uh, a man uh, that you met today, Brandon Bircher, who uh, talked about this dream or this envision uh, that, that we had thought about uh, originally and said, uh, I want to make this happen. And I've had the opportunity to, to work with him and, and learn from him and, and how this could happen. And I can tell you that uh, the result of that is, is what you've been, we heard today in this bill. Uh, it's been well thought out. I think it's a program that'll work. Um, I am here also in, um, in representing uh, Teamsters Local 631. Um, because of they do the studio transportation services uh, on movies and television. And these are not about, uh, these aren't jobs. And, and for Corbin and, and for these folks at Local 631, these aren't jobs, these are careers. Because that's what this infrastructure changes the game from production companies that will come in and what they've been doing before, come in, do some work, and then leave uh, with not having the sustainable jobs, good jobs, Good jobs while they're here, very good jobs while they're here, but not a career. And, and with this infrastructure bill, uh, this is what I believe will be the start of careers for uh, folks from UNLV and, and the folks that we represent. I thank you for your indulgence, Chair, and, and thank you, and I, we ask you to please uh, support this legislation. Okay, thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Piper Overstreet, O-V-E-R-S-T-R-E-E-T. I am here on behalf of the Las Vegas Raiders. We support the passage of SB 496, 
This bill is a win-win for Nevada and for our valued community partner, UNLV, which also happens to be one of my alma maters. Um, it will power the university's future while positively impacting the state's economic outlook. SB 496 is designed to address the challenges posed by the post-pandemic economy by fostering a skilled workforce and providing educational opportunities for future talent, even within our own silver and black studios. It creates permanent long-term film studio infrastructure and strengthens the partnership between academia and the film industry through integration with UNLV. This film and infrastructure program has the potential to bring about a positive transformation and opportunities for growth. This is why we support SB 496. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Good afternoon, Senator Neal and committee. For the record, my name is Adam Mack, last name M-A-C-K. I'm the legislative director for the International Association of Theatrical Stage Employees, Local 363, representing Reno and Lake Tahoe. Uh, Pink Cadillac, Kingpin, Sister Act, Jack Frost, True Lies, Misery, these are all films that were made in northern Nevada, uh, a landscape that is still just as beautiful, alluring, and attractive today as it was at the time the films were made. Um, we believe that uh, with the film industry setting up shop in southern Nevada, they, they're very likely going to come back to northern Nevada where we have such a beautiful landscape to make uh, such wonderful films. Additionally, the generation of stage workers who made those films are on the verge of retirement at this point, and it's a critical moment in our organization to have that institutional knowledge transferred on to the next generation who's eager and willing to learn. So with all that being said, we uh, urge you to support this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. My name is Candace Townsend, and I represent the city of North Las Vegas, and we are in support of SB 496. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Neal and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Nick Schneider, representing the Vegas Chamber. Uh, we'd like to thank Senator Lang for bringing this bill forward. I actually had the privilege of serving alongside her as the staff liaison for the Economic Development Committee of the Southern Nevada Forum, uh, where the concept of this bill was discussed and determined as a priority for that region. Uh, as a brief overview, the Southern Nevada Forum was established to provide bipartisan uh, policy that addresses the priorities of Southern Nevada. The Chamber is in support of this legislation as it helps diversify the Southern Nevada economy. And in the interest of time, uh, we believe that SB 496 represents potential thousands of new jobs, an opportunity to upskill our labor force, and support for our established industries uh, through film based tourism. We urge your support. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Nicole Rourke, representing the city of Henderson. Um, we, I'd like to echo the comments of my colleagues. Um, and while uh, Zone 1 and Zone 2 are not in the city of Henderson, we recognize the overall positive impact um, that uh, the film industry will have with this bill um, on our economy and um, our overall well-being in the state. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Alejandro Rodriguez with the Nevada System of Higher Education, and she's in support of this legislation and the opportunities it'll provide for our students and graduates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Chair Neal, members of the committee. My name is Tom Clark. I'm here on behalf of the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce, and why in the world would we support this when everything's going to happen in Las Vegas, right? Well, I'm going to tell you a little story. When I was 18 years old, I managed the Sherwin Williams Paint Store right down the street. <laughs> and one day, these guys came in and they said, we're pretty much going to buy you out of everything you have. And I was like, well, that's fantastic. What are you building? They said, we can't tell you. They cleaned us out. Rollers, drop cloths, paint brushes, about 300 gallons of paint. But they wanted it delivered. So I delivered it to the meadow behind Costco. That meadow became the site of the movie Misery. It was fantastic to watch them build that entire space and create that movie. I didn't get to meet James Caan, but I did get to meet the pig, whose name was Miser. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. I, we know that this happening in Las Vegas is going to have its footprint on northern Nevada, whether it's the landscape because of Tahoe, because of the moon, if you want to film on the moon, we have that. You want desert? We have that. We have all these beautiful places. If you're going to do your production and post-production in Nevada, why not do your filming here too? We know that Northern Nevada will benefit from this. We very much support it. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Next. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Serena Kasama with Carrera Nevada on behalf of the Nevada Realtors. The Nevada Realtors are in firm support for this bill that will bring economic diversification and job creation. We think this is a tremendous opportunity and we thank the sponsor, uh, Senator Lang, for bringing forward this bill and we thank the chair for having this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Kelly Crompton representing the city of Las Vegas. The city partners with the Chamber of Commerce to host the Southern Nevada Forum, so we are in support of this bill as it came through the forum process. Um, the city is also very excited to um, welcome the, this industry into the region and to div diversify our economy. Um, we look forward to working with the people that come in and hope to host them in the historic downtown Las Vegas area. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Senator Neal, James Reed, President J.R. Lighting. I'm the guy 14 years ago that wrote the initial bill. I worked with Paul Aisley at the time to try to get it passed. It took us a few years, but in 2013, Aaron Ford helped us and we got our bill passed. It has been something that has helped our industry through the years, but one of the things that's always bothered me is the lack of local crew and lack of local vendors being treated well by these out-of-town companies. I've always said that we need to be better at our regulation and how we make sure that locals who are here now, companies like mine who have been 33 years in business and me who I've been a resident for over 60 years, we are part of the community and we all should have those opportunities as well. Uh, I do support having a larger incentive. I think it's a fantastic idea. I've been trying to build infrastructure my entire life here. Infrastructure is a fantastic idea. So I do support those ideas, but we do need to make sure we take care of our locals as best we can in this. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. For the record, Danny Thompson representing IBW 396 and 1245 Operating Engineers Local 3 and Local 12 and Laborers Local 872. We're in full support of this bill. Not only do we believe this bill will create thousands of good paying jobs, uh, both in construction and production, but this is a huge opportunity to further diversify our economy and we think the state should make the best of it. We support the bill, thank you. Thank you for that. Next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Alexis Motorex with the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors. We support the bill. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Michael Flores on behalf of the University of Nevada, Reno. And although this does not directly impact or affect us, we do want to offer support to our friends down south and know this will be good for the region and the state. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Apple Thorne. I'm the business representative for IATSE Local 720, representing over 3,000 behind the scenes workers in Southern Nevada. Um, while our members enjoy robust infrastructure in the convention and live entertainment areas, without that infrastructure, our film and television workers have been left to just bounce from gig to gig with large gaps in between their work. Having a studio in Southern Nevada would allow them to be able to build a real sustainable career with good paying union jobs and benefits. And it's also an important diversification of jobs for our members. Um, when the COVID shutdowns made it devastating for our membership to be able to work for more than a year, many of them, because it was unsafe to gather large crowds for convention or live entertainment, film and television work was able to continue. And those are other opportunities for our membership. And so for those reasons, we strongly support this bill. Thank you for that. Andy Donahue, Labor Employers Cooperation and Education Trust. Uh, quite pleased to join support of this bill today. Thank you. Next. Uh, hi. My name is uh, Phil Jaynes. I'm the president of IATSE Local 720. IATSE stands for International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. We represent all the workers behind the scenes that make the magics in film and the uh, television industry. If you go see a film, if you watch all the credits, a lot of those people are represented by uh, my local, or not my local, my international, and it's a lot of people and it's a lot of high-end paying jobs. It would be great if those people could stay in the community. Uh, a lot of times they have to move, uh, move around, chase the movies around, go to where the movies are, 
uh, in this situation with two studios being built here in the valley. Uh, it's just a great opportunity for those people to stay and perform their, their craft. Uh, to quote Assembly Miller, Assemblyman Miller, I am super duper duper excited for this bill. Uh, this will not only be a game changer for the state, but it'll be a game changer for everybody that works in the film industry in the state. And with that, we support it and thank you very much. Thank you for that. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Anthony Ruiz with Nevada State College. We support this bill. We also appreciate the presenter's um, desire to hire a local workforce and we hope we could, be, we could participate in that um, through our education programs. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next. Uh, Madam Chair, hello. It's great to be here. It's been a really interesting, good day. I'm Jeff Lester, L-E-S-T-E-R. I'm a director, writer, producer, and company owner. I own Big Picture Studios in Las Vegas. We've been in business for 25 years. And my wife, Susan I, Anton, and I, we moved here in 95, and we always felt like there was something special about We moved here from Los Angeles, and we felt there was something special about Nevada, so we stayed. Um, I've been passionate about this direction for a long time, and over the past year and a half, I've been in meetings and conversations with members of our business community, GoEd, Film Office, to build a more robust industry. I'm a staunch supporter of building Las Vegas and Greater Nevada into a thriving film and television center, and I'm very excited about what I've heard today. I agree with Assemblyman Miller as well. <laughs> it is super duper. And um, I want to also mention that this is a top-down approach. And it's very exciting to put that much energy into the system. There is something else from those of us that have been in this community and working as you know, our uh, gift to be able to do this uh, for the last 25 years for me, JR Longer. Um, I've been shooting here for 25 years, and we have an excellent crew base already. Um, and it's a tight community, it's a, it's, it, everybody cares for each other, and um, I just want to say that the professionals that are part of this community will be the driver of the operations that will be built here over the next decades. And as the out-of-state professionals come in, they will be part of our film community, and that's a great thing. We look forward to building a bigger, robust um, film community. Um, and I just want to make sure that as we do this, to Assemblyman, Assemblyman Miller's point, that we also take care of everybody along the, the food chain. And that there are a lot of creatives such as myself who are here that want to make sure that we access these film credits and use them for our projects. We have some, <clears throat> I have four films that are ready to go. And um, we look forward to being able to partner and work together on these things. Uh, lastly, um, you know, uh, acclimating film students is a, a passion of mine. And, um, you know, I feel like if you don't, you can learn what you can learn in school, and then you need to actually have the on-the-job experience. Um, I have started this in my own company. I've started to bring on students from UNLV. I have a student right now that just came to me through Danette at the film office, Sylvia Diaz. She was referred to me, and so she's going to come on to our shoot. We have an, the next shoot coming up is early June. And um, so she's going to come on with us, because I believe that that's what you do. You train the young ones to be the people of the next uh, part of this. And um, so I believe that we can work together, and we don't have to wait three to five years to start training these students. They can be on film sets today. So yes, I'm totally in. I want to play as big as you do. And I ask that uh, we make sure that we have Everyone has all the rights to these incentives, and it's not just, you so, know. Thank you for that. So just really quick, and I'm just a point of privilege, and this is really bad on me. You said Susan Anton, right? Right. Like as in Cannonball Run 2 That's it. Anton? Yep. Okay, all right then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, we thought we'd move back. <laughs> And, you know, we've stayed. So I'm glad that this is happening. You know, this is what we wanted. We wanted this place to be big, and it will be. So okay. thank you very much. Thank you for that. All right. Oh, to, to him? OK. So we have a question for you from Senator Spearman, and then I'm going to go down south. Mr. I don't know what his name is. I don't want to call him Mr. Anton, because that's not right. <laughs> Yeah. 
Senator yeah. Spearman has yeah. a question. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and so you, you uh, alluded to a couple of things at the end of your testimony. You said it's good to play big, but, and then you kind of trailed off. So what would you envision this project doing that would help you? And I think it was Mr. Reed yeah. who said something. So how, would, how could this project help what you all are already doing? 25 years for you, and I think Mr. Reed said 33 years? Yeah. So talk to me. Listen, um, I have a project right now that we're planning to do pretty soon, and we've been saying well, we need to go out of state to shoot it. Because our investors are going to say, what's the film incentive in Nevada? You know, or do we even have the infrastructure there? Um, so I believe that by offering this 30% incentive, which is extremely competitive, you've set, up, you've set the table right. Because nobody's going to say, if we go to New Mexico, we're going to do better. Or we go to Canada, we'll do better. So that sets a good table. I just think that as, and I don't know how these incentives are going to work, but I think if it's a really equal playing field for people of all, you know, whether you're doing a $2 million film or a $20 million film, or a $200 million film, you know, involve everybody, especially those of us that have been here for a while, you know? All right, thank you for that. So we will go down south. I will start with the gentleman in the royal blue shirt, and then I will go across. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Stephen Dudley. S-T-E-V-E-N-D-U-D-L-E-Y. -E -E I represent uh, Southwest Mountain States Regional Council of Carpenters. In fact, uh, every carpenter that's in attendance here in Southern Nevada and every carpenter that's in attendance in Northern Nevada, if you'd stand up, please. Um, we are in complete support of this bill and believe it'll help uh, diversify uh, the great state of Nevada. So ditto. Thank you. Uh, hi, Chris Ramirez, uh, Lola Pictures, based in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I am a lifelong resident. Um, I have been in the industry since 2005, uh, mostly back then as a location manager on hangover movies and stuff. So. I've been on the, on the ground helping uh, productions come here. Then in 2013, I uh, was part of the team that um, helped push this bill through. And in 2014 and 15, we financed and produced back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back movies, um, all using the uh, tax incentive in place. And, and so I will say from experience, I support this from experience. Um, as as well as being a unit production manager where other films have hired me and we have had to meet that barrier of hiring 50% or more uh, local crew so that we could take advantage of the, the incentive. So, so for those of, of the legislators that, that aren't aware of the protocols that are already in place, and I'm sure will be even you know, tighter going forward, um, we've had to do it. We've had to do the, the make sure they have Nevada driver's license. There, there's, there's a ton of, of, of paperwork already that, that vets the process to make sure locals are getting it. So I support it because we've done it and we've used it and we sold our tax credits to Caesars Palace uh, at the time immediately. Um, so it's a win-win for gaming. It's a win-win for locals. Um, and, and, and I filmed everywhere from the Nevada State Prison to strip clubs, to North Las Vegas jail, to Virginia City, to the, to, to the Strip, to Lake Mead, and, and places that weren't even supposed to be Las Vegas so that we could stay um, in Nevada and, and reap the benefits of the, of the former tax uh, credit. So I think going forward, I just want to say that, that I think live locations are a big part of why people come to Las Vegas and making sure that the Zone 1 and Zone 2 um, that, that, that the non-infrastructure part of it, whether it's 10, 15 million dollars, is enough to support productions not being shot in the studios because that's what's always made Las Vegas, Las Vegas also. Um, no offense, but. <laughs> so thank you very much, definitely in support. Thank you for that. Next. Good afternoon, excuse me, let me mic check. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. It is truly an honor to be here. For the record, my name is Jason Soto. Last name is spelled S-O-T-O. -O. I'm the director of special projects for VIEW Technologies, which owns and operates VIEW Studios. And I will also add that I am a proud Las Vegas native. 
View Studios is a state-of-the-art virtual production company with a network of LED sound stages across the country certified for the use of virtual production, the film and video production industry. I want to highlight that virtual production is the future of filmmaking. The use of the studio-based technology is creating a major paradigm shift in the film industry and is making a historical impact on filmmaking similar to the introduction of the digital camera. This filmmaking technology has been used in the making of Disney's The Mandalorian, HBO's Game of Thrones, Marvel Studios' Guardian of the Galaxy, Paramount Studios' Yellowstone, and countless other productions that you see on TV every day. With the support of the Governor's Office of Economic Development and the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, View Studios opened a 43,000 square foot state-of-the-art virtual production studio in April of 2022. Since opening our doors, we've had an overwhelming support from the local business community and the Hollywood film industry. We've made a significant investment in real estate, technology, and workforce in Las Vegas because we believe that this is the best city in the world to do this and the right place for the ever-growing film industry. In just our initial 12 months of business, we've had the opportunity to attract two major feature film projects with a third on the way, documentaries for major, major streaming platforms, national TV commercials, and even hosted special events during major trade shows that our city is host to. These productions created jobs for the local film industry workers, both union and non-union, and film uh, school college students, as well as new unexpected revenue streams for small businesses that were not forecasted without our investment and our drive to bring the film industry business to the community. In addition, we have launched a workforce development program with UNLV College of Fine Arts and the UNLV Film School by installing a virtual production studio on campus and launching a three-year internship program allowing students to attend school here and work school here, and work here, excuse me. I'll note that the projects we did bring here were a tough sell due to the lack of film incentives compared to other markets such as Georgia, Louisiana, and New Mexico. We had to make many concessions and work with local businesses to bring these deals here to Southern Nevada. We are in support of SB 496 for the purposes of continuing to diversify our economy by driving growth in the entertainment sector, building the needed studio and technology infrastructure, attracting hundreds of supporting businesses, thousands of skilled workers, and most importantly, the education pipeline needed to facilitate the growth of the industry. The film industry growth is forecasted to be $170 billion by 2023. And with these incentives being offered, a good Excuse portion me. of that growth will happen here in Nevada. Yes, ma'am. So we're over time. So we're over you could time. close out. Sorry. You could close out. Yes, absolutely. In closing, we build a film studio here in Nevada because many benefits that have been mentioned today. We need government support in order to maintain long-term sustainable business model and to continue to attract projects that will drive long-term revenue to the state. With the state's support, we look forward to the diversification of Nevada's business landscaping and landscape by wel welcoming our ever-growing film industry, which will be a significant contributor to the state's economy. We're a can-do economy, so let's get this one done. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank All right. You. Um, is there anyone else down south? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and State Assembly. My name is Rich Hopkins, and I own Thrill Seekers Unlimited. We are the stunt professionals that you see in all the trailers that sell your movies, uh, and we risk our lives doing it. So my, I share the same concerns that JR has, and I think everybody that knows me in this room knows that I'm a big proponent for us working because 90% of the productions, the, the larger productions that come in here, they bring 90% of their people with them, and we sit on the sidelines. And it's really unfortunate because I, I think that that was missed in the last go around on the tax incentives. So I just want to make sure that there's a level playing field for people that live here, 
own homes here, have families here. Because what happens is if you build this, this awesome facility and have all these incentives, what's going to happen is people are going to come here, get these big paychecks, and go spend it back in their own city or state where they live. So um, I'd also like to address the UNLV. Um, which is awesome. They do a great job in their film program. I think the one thing that's missing is the stunt element because I have a lot of young filmmakers that come out of film schools, whether it's UNLV or wherever, and they want to bring me on to help them with their production, but they have no, they know nothing about the intricacies and the, all the departments I have to work with and the incentives, uh, I'm sorry, the, the vetting that goes with insurance and, and underwriters and brokers. So I want to help and support uh, SB 496, however I can, and I'm here to help in my little world, which is stunts, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Neal, uh, Senators of the Committee, Senator Lang and Assembly Miller. My name is Marco Henry, M-A-R-C-O-H-E-N-R-Y. I am a union line producer and unit production manager for 20 years in this business. And 10 years ago, I moved here to Las Vegas, right around the time that the original incentive got going. And, well, I'm in the film business, so what can I do other than tell you a story? When that film incentive came, I was extremely excited. But what happened subsequently was, it's my job, amongst other things, to make a lot of the decisions about where shows get shot or at least to prepare all the comparative budgets between different states to show which is the best place to do. And best I could do over the past 10 years, I tried time and time again to try and get shows to come here, but every time it didn't pencil out, and another state got the business. And I had to get on a plane, go to Georgia, Louisiana, uh, Canada, uh, France, Hungary, anywhere but Nevada to get work. And I hired thousands and thousands of, of film workers, spent millions and millions and millions of dollars outside my home state, came home from time to time to see my wife and remind her who I was, and then got on a plane for the next one because I couldn't get the tax incentive to pencil out. I just got back from Atlanta uh, from a, a show in Trillith Studios, which 10 years ago was 700 acres of dirt and nothing more. 10 years later, they shot Captain America, Civil War there, get, uh, got into the Galaxy Volumes 2 and 3, Spider-Man, Black Panther 1 and 2, the list goes on. They've got a million square feet of production space there. Why? Because they had an infrastructure incentive that made sense. So I am absolutely in support of this bill. I do have technical uh, aspects that I'd love to discuss uh, and make myself available to suggest some improvements, including specifically, as others have mentioned, bringing along the locals who have been here all along and making sure they still get a fair shake at it. Um, preserving perhaps the 5% uplift for rural shooting. Um, and also some slightly more uh, serious measures to discourage bringing out a town crew and to encourage hiring locals. These are all technical issues I'd be happy to discuss. I'd make myself available. Um, but other than that, this is a great bill. I think it will be amazing. And I urge passage of uh, SB 496. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Chair Neal and esteemed committee members. I'm Ann Barnett, CEO for the Nevada Contractors Association, here to express our strong support for SB 496. Grateful for the economic um, opportunities, education, and jobs it will bring to the construction industry. Ditto to the uh, previous supporting remarks. We ask that you consider and support SB 496. Thank you. Okay, so d how many more people do we have in Grant Sawyer? I have 15 more minutes for support. Okay. I believe there are about five, Madam oh, Chair. Okay, and then I'll have to go to the phone. So go ahead. Hello, my name is Tom Venozzi. I'm a television cameraman, have been for 53 years. I'm raised here in Las Vegas, my hometown. I'd like to bring a kind of a unique perspective that nobody has mentioned. I've also tried to bring studios to Las Vegas over the decades and uh, have witnessed a lot of failures, a few successes. There's been television trucks that have been based here in Las Vegas. There's a tremendous amount of specifically strip-associated shows that have to do with music variety and award shows. Uh, thank you for letting me present to this committee some ideas that I presented to Senator Reid during the President Obama's search for infrastructure construction. 
The concept was to build studios in deep rock quarries in the Spring Valley area bordering on Durango Drive. These deep quarries would be built up with stacked studios on top of each other to reach ground level. The concept of studio stacking is used in New York City where shows like the David Letterman show, Jimmy Fallon shows are televised, only this would be on a much more grand scale. The benefit of putting studios underground in Las Vegas is to provide noise and heat insulation to use the ground floor for office rehearsals, stages, and parking. These pits are so large, studios would start with the bottom most being the smallest and the biggest just below ground level. My concept began with a time when I was working at ABC and Prospect Studios in Hollywood when an earthquake rattled the stage causing a scary scene with parts of lights, fixtures, and sound speakers falling to the stage floor during a rehearsal. This was because of an earthquake. An obscure civil defense paper created a study about how would all the massive industries in Southern California continue if a catastrophic earthquake paralyzed all those industries located in SoCal. Of course, the television stage and film production centers in the United States is in Southern California. The study went on to propose where shipping, trucking, telephony, computing, and other major industries, and of course TV and film production, would be relocated as Southern California rebuilt. My idea was to fill the quarries in Spring Valley with studios built on top of each other in the quarries. Each floor of the stage would be sponsored and paid and supported by different studios from Southern California. In the aftermath of the earthquake, studios would bring shows, sets, and cast and crew to Las Vegas to continue to have at least some production continuing for the rest of America to watch while SoCal recovered. It would also grow the TV and film industries here in Las Vegas. This was an idea that came about because of President Obama's uh, desire to um, go ahead and, and uh, do construction of different kinds and to rebuild the, the, uh, con the, rebuild, uh, the this country as there was different um, um, things happening during COVID. What you're so, doing right now is a me. wonderful idea. Okay. Yes. Could you close, give us a final sentence? We're over time. Kent, thank you. Um, there, is, there is a lot of, uh, of things that are wonderful about this bill. People will bring their television camera operators and their producers and directors from out of state. We will get a portion of the jobs, but it won't be every job. The, we need to build the community up. A lot of people have moved to Las Vegas from Southern California to live a better life here, and they still commute down to Los Angeles to do the jobs. This is not just film, it's also television. Even though the bill says film on it, it what needs to also say television. There are substantially more people that work in television than work in film. With all the TV shows that happen, television has a substantially bigger set of employees that will work and live here in Las Vegas than the film crews, which will do a wonderful job, but they'll go out on locations and shoot some things with the, with the casinos. So Thank, thank you. you. You know, you, you can you submit know. your tes testimony in writing if you would like for us to read more of your comments. Um, you could get with the secretary down there and, um, and she can upload them as an exhibit. So you do have that option and we can read them as a committee. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I had tried to contact uh, 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 the Senator Lang and, and communicate with her before this meeting, but I wasn't able to. Uh, she's extremely busy. Um, but you can upload your can comments. <laughs> You can upload your comments and she can see that in the exhibit. So make sure you get with the um, secretary down there on the fourth floor and hand her your, she can take a copy to upload. Okay, thanks, next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Rick Neal, last name N-E-A-L, and I'm here as a president and CEO of Goodwill of Southern Nevada. Um, I'll quickly echo the comments about the wisdom of diversifying our economy. No more to say on that. Um, I'm in support of this legislation primarily for two reasons. Number one, the focus on the existing infrastructure to create the workforce, uh, and that includes K-12 and higher education. 
Um, I've speak, spoken to many of you about our role, Goodwill of Southern Nevada's role in workforce development. As a workforce development uh, participant and um, contributor, um, this makes our job exponentially easier to put people into careers that have an upward trajectory. Um, we're doing some of that work in healthcare right now. We believe we can do some of that same work alongside of the film industry. Um, we've already started with some of our conversion techs. We think this is a wonderful opportunity to create more opportunities for people, the underserved communities that we've been serving for almost 50 years. So glad to be in support. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Next. Madam Chair, committee members, for the record, my name is Alfonso Lopez. Um, I represent the sheet metal and air rail transportation workers. We are here in full support of the bill, and I just wanted to echo what a lot of people are saying. Um, when it comes to these um, tax credits and this prevailing wage, if there's anything we can do um, to protect Nevada work workers and keep the money rolling in Nevada, a community workforce or benefits agreement would be something to think about, but anything to help to keep Nevada money rolling in the Nevada economy. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Alexander Anderson, and I'm just one union carpenter of 5,700 here in the Las Vegas Valley. Several representatives here have touched on the majority of concerns for many of us in the trade unions. But that said, SB 496 is particularly important to me and my wife, as the approval of it would mean lasting employment, not just for us, but for thousands of other Nevadans for decades to come. With regards to involvement of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, a prominent hardship facing students within the College of Fine Arts is the lack of real world experience and networking opportunities within the film industry. My wife decided to attend the stage and screen acting program with the dream of pursuing her passion while helping to support our developing family. While greatly beneficial in developing her craft, she hit a roadblock during and after her attendance where there seems to be a disconnect between the university and talent agencies as well as individuals currently working in the film industry. There is a near complete absence in connections with union representatives in UNLV. The construction of the Las Vegas media campus would be the bridge between that gap, opening the door to thousands of actors and technicians aspiring for lifelong careers in entertainment. Using conservative estimates, according to several sources, including the Bureau of Labor Statistics, back in 2021, the unemployment rate for those in the performing arts varied anywhere from 5.5% to 7.6%, when the national unemployment rate for the time was roughly 5.5% as well. However, this can be alleviated for Nevada by providing the means of getting into contact with professionals with the intention of fostering individual skill and employability. Therefore, I implore you, to seriously consider passing SB 496 in order to support working Nevadans as they seek better jobs, wages, and benefits. Thank you so much for your time, and we all look forward to the creation of thousands of jobs that you can raise a family on. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Eddie Fickett, uh, president and owner of Las Vegas Production Services, member of the Directors Guild of America, and Teamster 631. I strongly support this bill and hope it passes. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I will, I have six minutes. So you will be my last three and then I have to go to the phone. So go ahead, starting with the woman. Turn on your mic. I'm Courtney Bass. I am a proud member of SAG-AFTRA. Um, I moved to Los Angeles at the age of 27 from the East Coast, mainly doing theater and some TV, but it wasn't until I got to LA that I had a career. And no, you wouldn't have found me on the cover of any magazine. No, I didn't have this huge scrolling IMDB page because back then we didn't have that. But I did have a career, and this is how I have the proof. I was able to actually, through my hard work in Hollywood, purchase my first home. I was able to qualify for real health insurance for the first time. Um, SAG, vision and dental. I was very proud of that. Uh, life took me away from LA years ago. Many others have followed as well. In fact, a lot of production companies have moved out. We know that. Um, today, my new senators in my new state in my new home of Nevada had the opportunity to bring the best parts of Hollywood to Nevada. By saying yes on this bill, you say yes to Nevadans dreams. And I'm not talking pipe dreams. I'm not talking superstar dreams. I'm, I'm not talking gracing magazine cover or just regular dreams. 
both working in an industry we love while, while qualifying to be homeowners, while having great quality health insurance coverage, vision and dental, and oh, my adulting dreams are not over. I'm not done. I have seven more working years to qualify for my SAG pension, and boy, if I could get this, I sure would feel very successful if I could attain that. Saying yes on this bill says yes not to superstars, not to magazine covers, but to regular adulting dreams of stability and security working within our great industry. I look forward to the outcome today. I look forward to your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Thank you for letting us have the opportunity here. Uh, my name is Christopher Burris. Uh, thank you, Senator Lang. I too am a dreamer and I love your pipeline to the future. I just hope it's union made. I'm here um, as a representative of SAG after as well, but primarily I'm here as a producer and seeing the, uh, that my little business, my wife and I own, I'm a veteran as well, uh, that's in the wedding business can have greater opportunity to see growth in this town because we, we get the nicest people, we get the best people in our little chapel. And uh, what thing mostly I'd love to see happen is that the talent that is in this state gets to stay in this state. And the component of the uh, UNLV tie-in with SUNY, I just can't imagine who came up with that, but I want to give them a hug. So whoever came up with that, thank you. Um, this, uh, I'm from a state where, uh, New York State, where a lot of kids leave and they go elsewhere. They might go to the city, but that's not doing too well right now. So anything that can keep talent in this state and bring new talent in, we'll take all the good people we can get. Thank you for letting me get, do these comments. Thank you for that. Next. Hello, my name. Next. Hello, my name is Richard Delacqua. Um, I am in strong support of this bill. Um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's awesome. Okay, so <laughs> BPS, I'm going to go to the phone line and support. BPS. To testify is pulling SB 496, press star 9 to pick your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chairman Neal and members of the com committee. For the record, my name is Russ James, R-U-S-S-J-A-M-E-S, -S -E uh, with the Nevada AFL-CIO, longtime member of the Painters and Allied Trades. And yes, we are in support of the bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Dion Klug, D I O N N E K O U G. I'm with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 711 from Las Vegas, and we are strong support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Neal and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Robert Sumlin, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-U-M-L-I-N, and I'm with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local Lodge SC-711 in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm here in full support of Senate Bill 496, and I urge the committee to support it as well. Thank you. If you've just joined us, I would like to testify in support of SB 496, press star nine to take your place in the queue. Is there anyone? Hi, this is Frank Woodbeck with the Hi, this is Frank Woodbeck with the College of Southern Nevada. Is enthusiastically supporting this bill. Thank you for that. Is there anyone else uh, BPS in support? Yeah, one moment. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Price, and I'm the founder of Dojo Moore Consulting. I currently live in Las Vegas, Nevada. I want to thank you for your attention to this matter regarding SB 496. I authored the study, Attention is the Asset, which is included for your evaluation of the Senate bill. 
Previously, I was the director of the Nevada Film Office since 2013, when we implemented Nevada's then newly approved 80 million tax incentive program. Prior to this, and currently, I am a certified public accountant and served in various executive roles in finance and the casino and hotel industry. My financial knowledge and tourism experience was of great value building the program from the beginning. And due to my experience and understanding of the entertainment and tourism industries, the Association of Film Commissioners International elected me to their board of directors. As the film commissioner who is an experienced financial manager and auditor, and able to explain financial concepts more simply to filmmakers, creators, legislators, or anyone to make incentives more easily understood. In summary, the attention is the asset, and we gain attention when we create content. And content creation requires infrastructure. Infrastructure requires investment costs. And the benefits of an investment should exceed its costs. The benefit of the attention gained to Nevada brand is more measurable than ever and should be considered in your decision. I thank you for your attention to this matter. And if you have any questions, I can be reached at uh, www.ericprice.com. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There are no more calls. So, so that ends our time for support. BPS, I'm going to switch to opposition. Is there anyone in, yep, okay, anyone in Carson City in opposition come and fill in the two chairs? Is there anyone down south in opposition? Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders, and I'm the Policy Director with the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada, here in opposition to Senate Bill 496. As we near the end of session, you have a number of bills before you in finance and ways and means that would fund important programs for Nevadans, like gender-affirming health care coverage, funding for our education system and environmental justice programs. Um, and yet, once again, we are talking about corporate welfare instead of revenue and funding the programs that Nevadans need. We understand the need for good paying union jobs, but we need to be sure that we can take care of workers' families and their full lives. Are we prepared with the infrastructure needed for a continued increase in population? Do we have enough teachers in the state, enough healthcare providers, enough available housing, or enough water? My husband and I moved here five years ago for a job, and as we prepare to welcome our first child this fall, we have started to worry what will be available for our child five years from now. I wanna raise my child in a community with fully funded schools with classmates who have access to proper mental health care and supportive services, and with safe green spaces to spend their time outdoors. If we continue to give away tax breaks to major corporations, I'm afraid this won't be able to become a reality. We urge your opposition to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress, here today in opposition of SB 496. I want to make it very clear. We are not opposed to business nor diversifying our economy. We have been very consistent on this issue over the years. Growing and diversifying our economy is important and necessary, and we have talked about needing new revenue for years now. We agree with jobs coming here, especially for our union families. What we are opposed to is yet another handout to a multi-million dollar company when those investments could go to our schools, our healthcare system, affordable housing, infrastructure, mental health, or literally anything else that are critical needs to Nevadans. We don't do this for regular people in Nevada. Regular people are struggling to buy homes and keeps, keep roofs over their heads for their families. Meanwhile, we are telling corporations to come here for cheap and we'll foot the bill. We've been here before, and I've seen this my entire life in this state. We went through this with Allegiant Stadium, where the proponents assured us if you build it, they will come, and it's a win-win for everyone. And it wouldn't cost the Nevada taxpayers very much at all. We went through this with Faraday Futures, who promised investments and jobs. That clearly collapsed quickly. We discussed it last session with Innovation Zones, and we saw how that scam played out. And now we're here yet again talking about giving the Oakland Athletics more public tax dollars on yet another stadium. I have to ask, when are we going to learn? This bill is just another example. 
I would like to also ask this body, when you will give the same energy to talking about bringing businesses here because of our excellent education system and stellar infrastructure instead of begging businesses to come through credits and abatements? I have come to learn that in this building that the actual Nevada way is putting businesses and wealthy CEOs over the backbone of our economy, which are my neighbors and our residents across this state. We offer these abatements and credits at the expense of our communities. I am beyond tired and frustrated. If you wanna bring your businesses here, then please do. Please do it at your own expense and stop using our communities to fund it. I am so tired of this song and dance each session. And yes, we absolutely must look at the costs and the balance sheets for this proposal. Please oppose SB 496. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next. Barry Cole, B-A-R-R-Y-C-O-L-E. I haven't heard anything about the medical infrastructure that will be in place when all of this comes down. And I want to take us back to the 1990s, which I believe some of us actually could remember, because every time a new casino came online in Las Vegas, approximately 20,000 people applied for jobs. 7,000 to 7,500 were employed. The remaining people became new patients of Southern Nevada Adult Mental Health Services. We had more beds, we had more capacity in the 90s than we do today. We've converted those beds from civil to forensic. Think about Northern Nevada Adult Mental Health. Used to be like a 130 plus bed facility in the 80s. Now it's down to 20 working beds. We have fewer and fewer resources that can't meet the needs today. I'm not sure how long you think it takes to train one physician, but from high school graduation to residency completion is no less than usually 12 to 15 years. So the pipeline, yes, I understand, goes into the 2040s, but we've got to start training more physicians, nurses, social workers, psychologists, anything you can think of, then we have a pipeline to produce today. And that does concern me. As a psychiatrist, I'm used to dealing with fantasies for a living, but this does sort of worry me that we can't meet current need and we're about to blow up the need we have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in Carson in opposition? Is there anyone down south in opposition? BPS, I will go to the phone line in opposition. Testifying opposition of SB 496, press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chair Neal and committee. My name is Jim DeGraffenried. I'm Nevada's Republican National Committee man in opposition to SB 496 on behalf of the Nevada Republican Party. Our platform reads, we support a free market economy. The government shall not pick winners and losers using taxpayer dollars, tax subsidies, loan guarantees, and bailouts. We, in fact, appreciate SB 394 from this session that attempts to control these giveaways. The specific case of SB 496, despite the rosy estimates of return on investment, it's well documented that handouts to the film industry bring neither enough direct revenue nor enough long-term economic development to offset the subsidies given. As evidenced by the support testimony, this bill proposes widespread handouts to the well-connected while ignoring the small businesses that are the heartbeat of Nevada's economy. Our businesses suffered from years of business-crushing edicts from our former governor, shuttered for no reason in an anti-science crusade that damaged our economy. Where are their subsidies? Where is their reduction of the modified business tax? Where is the repeal of the commerce tax which crushes small business with an unfair tax burden that has been repeatedly rejected by the voters? In case the authors of this rushed bill, which has only recently seen the light of day, miss them, we included links to three studies in our written testimony submitted to the committee secretary showing that film subsidies are net losers for state government. Even Variety, the unofficial newsletter of Hollywood, agrees. Nevada already hands out significant film tax credits to the tune of $10 million a year. We find no studies to show whether that massive amount of money has generated a positive net return. SB 496 could cost the state up to $2 billion, with grandiose claims that it will generate $55 billion. What are the odds of that? Please stop gambling with taxpayer money. Stop rewarding out-of-state companies at the expense of Nevada small businesses. Please work on tax reduction and reparation for Nevada's decimated small businesses. Make them whole first before a single dollar is given to California tin cup rattlers. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, we have, I believe, one more in opposition, BPS. That is correct, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Marcos Lopez, Nevada Policy Research Institute. Nevada Policy is opposed to Senate Bill 496, a proposal which stands to inflate the film tax credits to an astonishing $4 billion over the span of two decades. Historical data and economic analysis consistently show that film tax credits seldom pay for themselves or compensate for the revenue lost in the process. Supporters of SB 496 who continue to argue while supporting this legislation for higher taxes because there isn't enough money for education, mental health services, or wage increases for government employees reveal the duplicity and disingenuousness of their arguments. Senate Bill 496 effectively chooses to allocate taxpayer dollars to subsidize film producers and a multi-billion dollar industry over funding critical needs. The Tax Foundation has noted that every independent study of film tax incentives has found that they do not pay for themselves in economic growth, jobs, or boosted tax receipts. A similar viewpoint was expressed by the National Conference of State Legislatures, stating last year that states have performed evaluations of their own tax incentive programs have commonly found that despite positive anecdotal evidence that the companies put forward, such programs do not provide substantial return on investment, and if economic development is the goal, all their policy avenues might be more productive. This proposed bill diverts precious resources away from more impactful public investments. The $4 billion can be used and over the next 20 years to upgrade our education infrastructure, expand mental health services, or provide tax cuts for all Nevadans, all of which would provide more immediate and tangible benefit to Nevadans. We oppose Senate Bill 496. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. So we will move to uh, neutral. Is there anyone in Carson City in neutral? Is So there's a person down south that's in neutral. Can you go ahead and state your name for the record? Yep, my name is Tina Quigley. I am the president and CEO of the LBGEA, the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. We are tasked, as you know, with fortifying our economy by attracting and growing companies that, one, export stuff, services, and experience um, from outside of our region, and in doing so, import money into our region. Uh, job crea that create jobs, paying an average wage or higher than the state average wage, so we're not draining our economy. We're, in fact, creating a prosperous economy. Companies that invest in sig invest significant dollars in capital and equipment, so we know that they are here to stay a while. And also those companies that diversify our industry base to broaden our tax base and minimize the volatility. Well, certainly this industry and these projects do all that. They check all the boxes with explanation points. But we're testifying in neutral today because we do need some time to review the economic impact studies and the ROI on the tax credits. And we know you all will be doing the same. In closing, LVGEA sees SB 496 as the start of a meaningful effort to build this very important, attractive business sector and done right. We know film production has proven to bring a range of economic benefits to a region, including jobs, increased tourism, as well as generation of local business activity. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Quigley. You, I think Ms. you Quigley. confused us all because you were in the video. <laughs> And we certainly are supportive of these projects. We look forward to learning more about the, the long-term economic impacts uh, through the studies. I appreciate you being somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, BP, is there anyone else down south in neutral? BPS, I'll go to the phone lines. Is there anyone in neutral? To testify in neutral to SB 496, press star 9 to take your place in queue. You're unmuted. Hi. Hi. My name is Jeremy Renner, for the record. Yeah. Uh, look, first and foremost, I want to thank the bill. All the things broken. Hello? 
I'm confused. So let me. Sorry, let me. Chair. We just lost the caller. <laughs> was that was that neutral or was that an opposition? That was neutral, and that was actual Jeremy Renner, like as in Marvel. Okay. <laughs> So, BPS, is there anyone else on the line? There are no more callers at this time. But there's hope that uh, he will call back. Um, so if, if he does call back, let us know. Um, <laughs> I probably can't pass at this moment, okay? So I'm gonna find myself in neutral, okay? <laughs> um, all right, uh, would you have any closing comments, Senator Lang, on the hopes that uh, Mr. Renner calls back? <laughs> Senator Lang, for the record, and Senator Neal, I did talk to Jeremy uh, today. And so um, I think you would have a good conversation with him. And I know he's very interested in this project and the future of film in Northern Nevada as well. I'm sure that's what he was gonna talk about. <laughs> but I, I don't speak for other people, so I'm not sure. <laughs> but I'll make sure to tell Carrie next time he calls. <laughs> Send her back, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I just want to thank you for your time today. It's been lengthy. Um, we've gotten a lot of information. I'm sure you're on overload. I'm on overload too. And um, I look forward to having continued conversations in the future. And I'm, I really thank Bircher and Howard Hughes and Sony, and in particular UNLV, for their partnership on this project because I think um, their investment in our community will um, help us so much to become, get in a sustainable economy that we can have great paying jobs into the future. And uh, I really like the idea. We talk all the time. I, for years, we've talked about keeping our kids that go to college in Nevada in Nevada. Wouldn't it be great to keep our film kids in Nevada and um, in these great jobs? And so I look forward to that. I look forward to these these projects creating a diverse workforce. I know they've already signed PLAs and look forward to keeping those jobs in Nevada in union um, households. And with that, Chair, uh, again, thank you so much for your indulgence today and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, do, uh, okay. Okay, all right. I wasn't sure if someone else was coming up. All right then. So. Uh, no. So we will, we will go ahead and uh, close the hearing on SB 496 and BPS. We will open up for public comment. Is there anyone here in Carson City for public comment? Is there anyone down south? He is on the phone. He's back on the phone. BPS, is Mr. Renner back on the phone? Mr. Renner, if you're on the phone, press R9 to put your face in the seat. <laughs> this is the best hearing ever. <laughs> is this thing working? It is. <laughs> Gee, this is the worst. Look, I want to thank Nevada Energy for keeping the lights on. This is the longest thing I've ever done in my life. I've been on hold for like four hours, you guys. All right. <laughs> Let me just get this out and get this over with. <laughs> I think this whole thing's awesome. My name is Jeremy Renner, for the record. <laughs> First and foremost, <laughs> I can't even get this out. Uh, like, I just want to thank the governor's office, right, economic development standards, you know, state of cancer, Hammond, Lang, right? Draft these important legislation. This is awesome. I can attest to the fact that Nevada is a dream state to film in. I've done it. It's amazing. I'm doing it again. I'm about to do it again soon. I recently brought Disney here to Washoe County to film my show Innovations um, about giving you know kids opportunities. Um, and I think filming here is is a great, giant giant opportunity. Now we filmed in Northern Nevada in around Reno for the last several years. The community's been welcoming and very supportive throughout um, with all the entities involved. Now 
know, Nevada is an incredible state for business. It celebrates competitive and open marketplace, one of the reasons why I live here. Now, I give free snowcat rides at the top of Mount Rhodes if anybody's interested. It's pretty amazing. Let me know. Now, I'm enthusiastic about the possibility of diversifying my, my home state's economy and being a part of the future of Nevada. <clears throat> but testifying in neutral only because I'm concerned about the exclusivity part that's proposed legislation gives to the southern part of the state. Nothing wrong with, with, uh, with Las Vegas. I've got a problem with it. <clears throat> Additionally, I'm concerned about the total control it may give a few of the groups in a massive industry that, that has a lot of growth and control of workforce at the SEC fit. Now, I work with uh, several major media companies and studios over the last 30 years, currently, you know, Disney, Marvel, uh, Paramount, uh, from Mary Kingstown, and all, a lot of uh, producers and people and developers want to express interest in building and growing studios in locations in the northern part of the state as well uh, when a, such a proposed tax incentive has been stated. Rural areas in this region are ripe for opportunity as well in this industry, Washoe County, including that, where I'm from. Um, I'd like to request an amendment to remove the 20-year exclusivity clause limiting the filming just to Las Vegas. Um, we got to allow for applications for more locations, studios, and other parts of Nevada. It's a big, beautiful state, y'all. Lots of landscape to exploit, especially in the north. Just saying. Um, Snowcat rides, Mount Rose. Uh, let's expand this amazing idea. Include rural areas in northern Nevada. As a stalwart supporter of these communities, I feel it's my duty to shed light on this important issue, speak on behalf of the counties that have less of a voice in this building, and make sure they're not left out or overlooked by this opportunity. I think waiting online for four hours um, proves that. All right, look, I just want to get off now. Thank you guys for your time. Chair Neal, uh, Vice Chair Donate, for your thoughtful consideration. Um, thank you, Nevada Energy. Um, keeping the lights on. Love you guys. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I think that will, we will close out SB 496. Um, we'll also close out public comment unless, and then we will adjourn uh, Senate Committee on Revenue.